Howdy, everyone, and Happy New Year. Today is Tuesday, January 10th, 2023, and the time is 6 p.m. We're here for the regular session of the Coppell City Council. There is a quorum present, so I'm calling the meeting to order. We will be convening into work session in the first floor conference room, and the public is welcome to join us. Thank you very much. I did have one reminder. We will be having a two separate public hearings tonight, and those public hearings are separate from our public of our citizens' appearances. So any citizens wishing to speak at either the citizens' appearance or the public hearings must sign the appropriate roster outside the council chambers. Thank you. So 2 p.m. and we're here for the work session of the Coppell City Council. We have uh, four items tonight and the first item A is discussion of the agenda items. Oh, uh, and I forgot to say Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, anybody have any questions, comments, or? I did a question about the agenda item. Uh, I saw one about the pool resurfacing. Okay. Um, C. Yeah. Uh, Sherry. Yes. Jessica. Yeah. Sherry. Um, for Diamond Bright, do they give the ten-year warranty for commercial use? Uh, so it's actually a fifteen-year warranty. Fifteen. Excellent. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that better. Than that. <laughs> Don. On, this, on that same agenda item, and this may be more. I don't know if it's more for Kim, but if I read the paragraph correctly, this is on the pool. Uh, only 15000 or something like that was actually budgeted. Well, I was trying to have trouble. Were we planning on using fund balance to replaster the rule to begin with? Is that correct? Yes, yes. But so, it's now escalated. The price is also escalated. Well, correct. There was originally 135000 budgeted for it, um, but when it was inputted, it was a clerical error. So that's why the okay. 13 5 came from. But oh, okay. for the fund, the undesignated fund balance is what we Okay, so the plan, we should have budgeted for the 135. That was the intent. Correct, yes, sir. But now it's 175 yes. or 9 yes. or something. Okay, I was just making sure it understood. Okay, yes. thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, seeing none, we're going to move on to item item B, a presentation on the projected hotel occupancy tax fund balance by Ms. Kim Tian. Good evening, Council. Uh, Jerry is helping me out. He's canceling out a handout that was actually in your packet, but we thought in case you wanted to take notes, um, it might be easy to have it in front of you also. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So as you might recall, during the December 13th Council work session discussion on the Chamber's presentation, 
a request for an update regarding the financial status of the hotel occupancy tax fund was made and this evening I am here to provide you with that update. Uh, the information, uh, this information should aid you in the chamber conversation that you'll have later this evening um, because this is the fund that you would use uh, to fund the chamber request. Uh, as you see, it, I refer to it as the hot fund, so during the discussion, I will uh, continue to call it the hot fund rather than the hotel occupancy tax fund. Um, and again, I just handed out, and it was also in your packet, a document showing the revenues beginning with the first fiscal year that the hot revenue was received, which was in fiscal year 2017. And this is projecting it out into 2027. Expenditures and fund balance, uh, they're both also shown for the same time period. So in that document, the information shown for fiscal year 2017 through 2021 is based on audited financial statements. Uh, fiscal year 22 is unaudited as the audit just kicked off last week. And then of course fiscal years 23 through 27 are projections. So with that, um, I'd like to share with you the assumptions used uh, for the projections. For revenues, the projections are based on information provided by hotels and then um, also taking into consideration <coughs> abatement agreements. For expenditures, the arts category projection includes funding for the local arts groups and the uh, annual cost of the arts center positions that were authorized by council um, back in November, on November 8th, um, which we included in the hotel, the hot fund. And next is the historic category, and projections include the Historical Society's annual operating cost of about $10,000, along with the request for their visitors um, center idea, which is just a little over 107000 The advertising category includes an amount for um, the art center advertising costs, and it also includes uh, the Coppell Chamber Marketing Plan. The Chamber Marketing Plan is included for fiscal years 23 and 24 only in your projections. So next, um, I thought maybe the most important part for you to see is projected fund balance. Uh, and so this final slide provides you a visual of the projected fund balance that is shown on your spreadsheet. Um, expenditures of the fund have been limited uh, as the fund was new. So in, in the beginning, we really weren't spending much, so that was allowing your fund balance to grow. And then in fiscal year 22, that was the first, uh, first year with any significant expenditures. Uh, in addition, as your handout shows, revenues um, more than doubled, which is attributed to new hotels coming on. And so considering both revenues and expenditures, the fund balance um, for fiscal year 10, 22 still grew, and fiscal years 23 and 24, those do show a reduction in fund balance. But then in fiscal year 25, fund balance does start to increase, um, and both fiscal year 26 and 27 uh, show an increase in fund balance. And so that's the, my presentation to you to update you on um, where your fund balance is projected to be, and I am happy to answer any questions. John, um, aren't there limits <coughs> in, for certain categories of what can be sold? Like, with, can you remind us right. what, what the limits are? I can. Um, so for arts, the arts category, you can spend no more than 15%. For historical, it's no more than 50%. And then for advertising, that's not less than 14.29%. And so all of them have caps, the maximum, but the advertising has a minimum. So there's no maximum for advertising. And there are other categories um, that don't have limits that are um, Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, there's facility, uh, 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 sorry, sporting events. Um, enhancing sports facilities, those don't really apply to us right now. So I really just wanted to target <laughs> arts, history, and advertisement. So the, uh, I'm just going to pick <coughs> one for example. So fiscal year 23, arts is 211,000 expenditures or projected at least. 
but that's certainly more than 15% of 680, but does it have to do with 15% of accumulated balance? Yes. Is that what it's, yes. is that how you're going to calculate that? Yes. So we're keeping track of okay. revenues from inception, and we're allocating 15% of revenues from inception, and we keep updating that number of revenues come in, and so we're tracking that in our fund balance okay. to show um, what is allowed based on the revenues that we've received and projected. Okay. And you said advertising has no cap. It's... It has a minimum. minimum. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. okay, thanks. You're and so 14.2? It's 14.29, and so it is, I believe that's one seventh. You have to take one, it's one percentage point of your total tax rate, and our tax rate is 7%, so it's one seventh. Okay. Any other questions? So, Opinion, healthy, available? It's available. It is available. You, you, have, you have a source to make decisions. So. John? Okay. There's, we're not really bumping up against any of those limits so far. Is that right? We Correct. So the projections that we're showing you, we made sure to keep arts at 15. Um, the uh, <coughs> historical, it's only... Um, projected to go to eight, and then advertising is projected to go to seventeen percent. So, and I'm sorry, I missed it all ago when you had the projections. So, the, what was the arts? What was the big increase? What's what assumption did you use for the, the arts? arts center positions that you all oh, approved right. for Jean right. and okay. November? <clears throat> and we're still, even with that increase, we're still well, well within that fifteen percent. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <coughs> okay, item C is a discussion regarding the additional funding request by the Coppell Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Ellie Braxton. Can I All righty, good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Um, we're back again. Last month we talked about this. We presented to you um, what um, our, actually our request for the um, 2023 funding. Um, and um, there were a lot of questions, so we made the decision that we needed to bring um, Belmont Ice House here, who is the marketing firm that's actually handling all of the marketing. So they are here. Um, Erica Page and Cassie, oh, I'm sorry, Cassie, can't remember your last name. Bunch. Cassie Bunch is, uh, who is a former Coppell resident, um, are here to talk to you about um, uh, 2022, what they did, how they spent the money, um, and answer any questions that y'all have regarding the report that they're going to show you at the end with results and all of that, the KPI. And, and then I'm going to come back and talk to you about our projections for 2023, um, what funding that we need, and how much we need. So I'm going to invite Erica and Cassie up real quick. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So I see we have to share one microphone, but I have a pretty loud mouth, so I don't think we'll be in trouble there. So I have to use this. Okay, this will help us go forward. All right. Um, as Ellie mentioned, we are uh, with Belmont Ice House, the advertising and marketing firm um, who was hired by the chamber to handle uh, the development of the brand as well as the campaign for uh, City of Cockhill. Um, again, I'm Erica. I am the account director, and Cassie is the media director for Belmont. So we did want to do a quick 2022 recap. We understand from your last meeting that there were a lot of questions, and we know that they're part of the discussion tonight is going to be regarding the 2023 budget. So I think it's fair before we do that that we take a look back and see how we spent the budget last year. Um, so first, what was our primary objective? So after we did discovery, we did research, lots of conversations, we boiled it down to our primary objective, which is to create an authentic yet strong and differentiated brand identity for Coppell to put it on the map as a must-visit, must-return destination within DFW. 
Once we narrowed down our primary objective, we're then able to distill our business objectives and our media objectives. So first, um, our business objective looking very similar to our primary objective, we want to drive more visitors to Cop Hill, yielding a positive economic impact. And then we have our media objective. So this is what Cassie then takes to put together the paid media plan. So we want to, one, generate awareness of the new Discover Cop Hill brand, and again, establish Cop Hill as a must-visit, must-return destination within the DFW Metroplex. I know a lot of this sounds very similar, but this is common. You have to start and then you have to boil it down, right? All right, so once we um, settled on our objectives, we mapped out a roadmap. How would we get there? So we broke it out into five different phases, with phase one starting with discovery and research. Um, we want to know more about Cop Hill. We want to understand who our target audience is. Um, and then we moved into developing the strategy. So this is really our foundation. It's very important that we set a strategic foundation before we start building a campaign and getting our message out to our target audience. Then once we did that, we decided, okay, we don't want to go to market as come to city of Cop Hill. We wanted it to be almost like a call to action. So after several rounds of ideating and several name options, we came up with Discover Cop Hill, and then we also created a logo for that. Then we move into campaign development. This is how will we take Discover Capel and position it um, from a branding and campaign perspective. Um, how do we want our target audience to receive our ads, our messages, our brand? And then phase five was campaign implementation. That is getting the media into market that's producing the whole campaign. So here is a quick look at uh, the Discover Capel logo. Then as I mentioned, we went into campaign ideation. So we call our campaign Close to Perfect. Hopefully you get the play on words. These are not the final ads. I just want to caveat highly that these are not the final ads that are in market. This is when we were exploring the look and feel. So we take this and once we get approval, then we produce <coughs> the campaign. So we did a photo shoot. With the budget that we had, we were able to get six beautiful hero shots. We're very proud of them, I think that they're amazing and we're really enjoying seeing them in, in the ads. I think um, they're really working hard for us. So this is just a quick sampling of some of the paid ads that we've had. This is paid social, digital display. So imagine banners, if you're surfing the internet, you get served up banners. This is our digital out of home. And then lastly, we have a streaming audio spot. I think I understand that it all automatically. Imagine the perfect day trip down the road, off the highway, not too far from home, and close to perfect. A place where farm fresh goods come from local folks, where you can explore the beautiful side of the majestic Trinity River, where charming locally owned shops are filled with one of a kind finds and tasty food, where you discover miles of parks perfect for nurturing your natural side. Discover these and other experiences in Cup Hell, not too far at all and close to perfect. Click the banner to learn more. So that is a quick look at our uh, paid media that we had. So now Cassie is going to take you through what did that paid media plan look like, the planning parameters, and what are some of the performance results that we have to date. So as Erica mentioned, all of those things that you just saw were the assets that were then running on our paid outreach. So um, you know, we, we start off, after that strategic development, we start off with, when, we, when we're talking about the paid part, who, where, when, what, and how much are we going to put in to market? So um, what shook out, out of the uh, strategic development are these three target audiences. So you have your on-the-go families, active enthusiasts, and active empty nesters, and you can see the age demographics there. Um, we're also targeting these counties, and this is based on a lot of research of where people are willing to drive in order to experience Coppell. Um, so priority, these are more in um, alphabetical order, but you can see, um, I know there were some questions about are any ads being served in Coppell? Well, Coppell obviously is a part of Dallas County. Um, we don't want all of our impressions to be in Coppell because people already know about Coppell. Um, that wasn't the goal or our objective was to bring people here. Um, but you can see we've got um, a good handful of counties that we're targeting. Um, the campaign started on October 27th, and um, I believe paid social is currently running right now, and it'll run through the end of the month. 
um, of all the media tactics that we were running. Um, so streaming audio, Fave, Pandora, Spotify, SoundCloud, um, iHeart uh, Radio, any of those. Digital display again is when you're scrolling through and you're trying to read an article and this <coughs> banner ad keeps popping up and ignoring you. Um, it's kind of intrusive and that was the, the point of it. So um, that's running there. And then we have the paid social ads as well as digital out of home. Um, a little bit more um, information on digital out of home. That is, um, you could be at the movie theater before the, the movie starts, you see the ad come up. You could be at the gas station. Your ad is um, on the video screen above the pump. Um, it could be in the malls, um, restaurants, uh, bars, any of those types of outdoor, um, and even the outdoor billboards. In total budget, we had about $66,000 that we put into it, and I have an asterisk at the bottom to let you know that 52, a little over 52,000, went towards um, the actual hard cost of media. And then this is, again, not to get too kind of marketing jargony, um, but this is kind of your standard marketing funnel and how people, you push people down this funnel in order to, um, <coughs> To, to message to people and to bring awareness to and get them to convert. So um, that, that dotted line going down the middle, that's what for this first phase, that's what we were tasked with. It's building awareness. We have to let everybody know about Discover Coppell before people are going to come here, right? So, um, or before you can have retention and advocacy. Um, so this is kind of the breakout of, you've got Belmont Ice House um, more on that, on that left side, and then it is Discover Coppell to kind of um, have the experience and, and communicating with people and having them come back and, and advocate for you. So that's just, a, again, a quick overview, recap of what we're doing. And then um, through um, January 8th, these are results so far. I've also included a link at the top, which is a dashboard that you can look at at any time. Um, but just to give a little bit more explanation of you know, what these numbers mean. So to date, we have 7.5 million impressions that have, um, that have rotated across that geo target that I had shown you guys. Um, so 6,400 engagements, that means anybody clicking on the ads, if it's paid social, they're commenting, they're reacting, they're sharing it with other people. Um, and, it's, and we've got an engagement rate of 0.09, um, which is 11% over the benchmark of 0.08. Happy to explain kind of those benchmarks or why we set those if people have questions about it. Um, <coughs> yes? <laughs> okay. Um, so a point oh nine <coughs> means of, of the, it's a ratio. So of the 7.5 million impressions that were um, sent out, um, then the 6,400. So divide that, you get the point oh nine. Um, this is based on industry standards for tourism. Um, it's, al it's also based on um, your brand new brand. People don't know about you yet. Um, it takes a little time for them to continue to see the ads. And that actually gets us to our second bullet of um, within the target audience, all of those impressions, it's reached 781,000 people. And over the course, well, ever, ever since October 27th, um, those people have seen the ads an average of 4.67 times. So you have to build that up in order to, and that takes us to the next slide, to then get to these KPIs. I apologize, it's a little small. Um, but for each individual tactic that you can see on the left-hand side, we look at, for our KPIs, we look at volume to make sure that what we set out to purchase and deliver, it is on pace to deliver in full. Um, and then we also look at quality metrics and value metrics. Your quality metrics are gonna be people's response. So ACR, and I can also provide a glossary of terms because I know there's a lot of acronyms <laughs> in this. Um, but for a quality metric, you've got um, audio completion rate. We want to make sure that if we're having that ad on Spotify, they're not hitting <coughs> next or skip ad. Um, so we want at least 75% of the time for people to listen to it all. Well, we're actually at 95%. So people are interested. That awareness is happening. They are also clicking on the ads. If you look at um, digital display, so that click-through rate, which is CTR, is the number of impressions that were served to the number of times the ads were clicked. Every time somebody clicks, it's going to your website um, that Cindy had developed for you guys. <coughs> so um, that is where we're sending people in order to get information and things to do and your calendars, all of those things that are going to bring people to Coppell and experience everything there is. 
I mentioned engagement rate, that's also for a paid social, and then for digital out of home, unfortunately people can't click on a convenience store ad. Um, so it's more about just making sure those impressions are being delivered. And then we also have the value metrics to make sure that it is being cost efficient and effective with your dollars. So um, again, these are all based on industry standards for the travel and tourism um, category, as well as um, just new brands in general. And you can see there's a lot of greens. So usually this, is a, this looks like a stoplight. You'll see reds, greens, <coughs> yellows, um, and luckily we're beating everything. So it, the awareness and the objectives that we're trying to, <coughs> excuse me, that we're trying to um, accomplish is actually happening. So when I first looked at this, I saw the negative <coughs> numbers on the value, yeah. and I thought that was bad, but it actually means that we're achieving yes, more sir. at a lower rate, which is yes, good. Which is good, yes. <laughs> That's why it's in green. So, Thank you. Um, yeah. We always want to come in lower on our values and higher on our quality. And then this is just if you, you know, get this is even more information. information. <laughs> yeah. If you want more information on each individual target audience, this is just giving you some metrics if you want to dive a little bit further on how on-the-go families are reacting to your ads versus active and empty nesters. And I think it's fair just to not derail too much. Like all of this information, we're gonna leverage as we move into 2023. We're gonna take a look back and see who responded the most. Do we wanna shift dollars anywhere? So um, certainly a lot to build off of moving into the next year. Yeah, that goes to you know 2023, depending on what those objectives are. Um, it, it may we may say, well, active enthusiasts need to be a primary target versus right. on the go families. On the go families may be more for day trippers. <coughs> active enthusiasts or um, active empty nesters are likely to spend a weekend here, um, or it may be more of a business target. Um, so for hotels and conferences. So those are things that we'll dive into for 2023. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Surely we're not getting off that easy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so if no one's, I'll go. So, <laughs> I think from last month, it showed that the, what was it, the, go back to the previous slide. The active enthusiasts were showing <coughs> being more engaging. Is there anything you would have changed knowing what you know now when you started out the campaign? So we actually have active <coughs> investors that are, engaging a little bit more mm -hmm. um, and I think you know I'm not going to speak to the creative side of it um, but a lot of times it's the messaging um, and so if we had if there was a little bit um, more going towards maybe the farmers market with the older gentlemen or the retail those are things that we certainly look at and then start optimizing and shifting those impressions okay. thank you mm -hmm. Don yes uh, I'm gonna get uh, I'm probably going to get way too basic, but I, can we back up just a second and go back to just like the objective of the campaign. So the objective of the campaign is to raise awareness, right? And and then ultimately <coughs> drive more people to come out. Is that fair? Am I stating that correctly? Yeah. Um, well, are you talking about the primary objective? Can you go back one, Cassie, please? Thank you. Well, where, where I'm ultimately always going is how would ignoring even us for a second how will you know when you've been successful on this campaign does that mean i mean yeah. what 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 okay. tells you that you are sure. continuing to be campaigning and what sort of the end state the end goal yeah. i mean uh, and, so, and, and apo uh, apologies when we talk about creating awareness i completely understand creating awareness but it's real intangible sure. you know like what so how do you put some meat yeah that? that's a great question and it's not overly basic um there is a lot of ways in marketing to measure results of something um usually you would start out with a pre-campaign some kind of pre-campaign research like a larger scientific study uh qualitative i'm sorry quantitative in nature to measure perceptions and awareness and then you would do another study Okay. You would need an extra about $60,000 to do that. Those cost a lot of money. Okay. We hire a research <coughs> firm. That's what they specialize in. They go out. They recruit participants <coughs> for that. And they're gonna, we're going to run the study, and we're going to see how we move the needle. 
Um, we can also do qualitative, like focus groups, but those usually for perceptions and awareness, we do like an online type of study. Um, so that's one way. Um, if y'all are seeing needles move, but like benchmarks would have needed to been, been set, like, you know, say we wanted to drive traffic to the farmer's market, I'm just using it as an example. Um, we would have needed to know like, where did we start? What all is running to push people to the farmer's market? Now, that wasn't one of our objectives to specifically drive traffic at the farmer's market. So, but when, all attractions, was there more traffic that was going, yeah. or more sales, yeah. that kind of thing? So, um, all that coming together to create an attribution. Yeah, sure. So, without um, access to other data, because it, we, we can't provide it all, <laughs> we do look at media performance. So, we're going to take how is our media plan? Uh, our media performing out in the market. And that's, and that's why we, we do that. Yeah. We're okay. people receptive to the messages. And that makes that makes sense. Um, and you know, <coughs> you know, we're sort of walking through this, and I mean, conceptually, it sounds like a great idea to, to really drive awareness and everything. But then when you really get to spending dollars, and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, what does that mean? I mean, sure. like what what where where are we going? Yeah. So like two years from now, I guess where would y'all anticipate mm -hmm. us being? I mean, I know you're going to continue to tweak. Advertising based on where you're probably seeing best results, right? You're gonna move media around, and but uh, like in a couple of years, I guess what's the next step, or what's yeah. wh where do we do we just do we we tweak commercials for the yeah. next ten years, or what? No, I mean, that's what? Our, no. So we do want to build on the campaign. That's why we want to start very strategically with our campaign, mm -hmm. um, so that we have something to build on, something that has legs, and something that's gonna serve you well for for several years. Um, excuse me, <coughs> um, we do not want to get ad wear out. We can usually start to tell when there's some ad wear out. Things will start, like you'll see performance kind of go down on ads. People aren't engaging with them. And so we, we get creative and, you know, we held off like on the six photos that we got. I think I had my team only create ads with three photos because I wanted to hold on to those two so we could create some new ads and freshen it up a little. So we do things that way. But with regard to where do we see y'all, I mean, we would need, that would really come from like a like a strategic goal from y'all. Like what kind of growth do you want to see? Um, but with regard to the <coughs> campaign, yes, we want to leverage this campaign and we want to keep it fresh and in market. And Cassie Mike can speak to like, we started awareness yeah. and then there's what we call the funnel and we we're so, pushing people down the funnel. I was, yeah, I was gonna kind of um, add on to that. So um, you've got that, uh, the awareness at the top of the funnel, and obviously the more that you're communicating with your target audience, the more they move down into consideration and then they actually start coming. Um, so that flattens funnel that I showed earlier that then has retention and advocacy. Mm -hmm. Obviously you don't want to always rely on acquisition and awareness. Um, you want to have that retention and advocacy, people are coming back, because then that, it just ends up being more of the circle. And so I would see over the next couple of years, we start really playing more in that mid funnel to lower funnel after we've, you know, building this awareness. You wouldn't have to have as much money going into awareness um, if, you know, we're phasing this and starting to push people down. So, um, you know, it, it does move and then it ends up starting over again, so. You know. uh, talking about the funnel, is the funnel that has the, a couple slides over? We didn't have the funnel in this Oh, okay. Deck. Well, the, this one. So yeah. this one right here, I guess that's what else. Yeah. Fun, so, you're right. um, just to clarify, so Belmont House, Alice House, Ice House, and so that's y'all doing your part. Uh -huh. Discover Capel, so who is this? So this would be hopefully an this online speaker. Is this the chamber? Is that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, is this yeah. like, chamber yeah. would start doing this, yeah. more of these mm -hmm. tasks? Is that, yeah. the, is that the way? Yeah, and that, that could right? be relationships with hotels and rewards programs. You know, incentive-based mm -hmm. type stuff that is, you know, email um, your getting a subscriber base. Um, mm -hmm. So you're communicating via newsletters. All those kinds of things that kind of fall into that, um, you know, after post-communication, after they've come and experienced. Okay. So it sounds like maybe there's still some meat on the bones to put, even from our standpoint. So like, where do we want it to go or what are the goals? Yeah. Working with the chamber, like where, where do we want everything to go is what it sounds like to me. And, and it doesn't mean that Belmont Ice House couldn't support <coughs> those, um, you know, deeper down the funnel. So I'm, I'm using the sun as an example. There's an e-newsletter. So we're, like, developing that. We can help copy edit it, finesse it, make it look great. <coughs> we're not supporting. We're just not leading 
that effort of shooting out the e-newsletter and making sure that people are signing up for it. If that or building those partnerships, relationships with right. the community. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, got Kevin and then Brianna. Um, thank you guys for the presentation. I think it, uh, to me it helped, I think, give a lot of structure to some things that we were, and some questions that we were asking about last week. So my question is, is so what we've been running this campaign for two, three months now, does that sound about October, right? October. Um, October 27th. Yeah, so, so there, there you two go. Months. So we're cut, two months. Um, I, I heard, as Don was asking questions, you know, there was talk about like, you know, in the next couple of years we may shift stuff, but um, how much, is how much time or how, how like, the ads and stuff, how long do you need that to run to really get solid data about what is effective to drive traffic to Coppell or, or increase awareness to Coppell? Like, is there any kind of guesstimate on do you need six months? Do you need a year? And then is that a point where we can measure that, you know, look at that and then, you know, decide the best way forward from there and maybe shifting up the strategy or something if we, if we like it or we don't like it? Do you want, you want me to take it or do you want to take it? Um, I mean, I can talk from a media perspective, okay. but if we're talking from a, you know, just overarching. Yeah. Well, you go first, I'll pick so it up. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Good usually one. from a media <coughs> perspective, um, you know, you're, this, is, this has been more of a brand launch light. Um, you know, it, we may end up narrowing in the geo target to have, you know, a higher penetration of reach and those kinds of things. So it really depends on those communication goals um, to then say, um, it's going to be a year or six months or whatever. I've, you know, if a, if we narrowed in the geo target, we could likely have a similar budget, um, and it'd be more closer in home. Um, you may be able to do that in six months, um, but if you're still wanting to go a little bit further out, then it's we're going to have to have more funds in order to get that reach sure. to then happen in six mm -hmm. months. So that is kind of like weighing those options of what. What are y'all okay with right now? Yeah. It could be six months, it could be a year, it could be a year and a half, just depending on what those reach goals are. Yeah. Does that satisfy the question? Because I know it's not like it's a, a little. It's not. A, there's not a cookie cutter response to it. It really depends on like what like y'all strategies are and what your goals and objectives fall out of that. That can completely change things. I mean, in a year, y'all might be like, we don't want to do paid media or I, I, I mean so much can change True. so it's yeah unfortunately there's not a, yeah. a different but there, is an answer. Answer. <laughs> there is an answer once we kind of figure those things out and that's yes. you know giving you those options so there is a scientific way to approach it just we need to have a deeper conversation about what that is. absolutely yeah. no it, it, it makes sense to me I just wanted to make sure that my colleagues around the table here absolutely. are hearing hearing those, <coughs> those types of conversations because I do think as Don said it's like you're grabbing for air. You're not quite right. sure because because it is an awareness campaign, so it's it's harder to measure. Right. So, so just well, and absolutely. I mean, you're not going to have the awareness of Dallas um, overnight mm -hmm. um, when you're a smaller community um, within Dallas. So it's setting yourselves apart from just people, even from um, you know several counties over. Him going to Dallas, but they're really coming to pop up. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes a little bit of time and. Um, we don't have to have all the funds in the world in order to do it. We just need some, you know, a little bit of time. I guess my my, my piggyback on this is, um, do we have any uh, similar like communities that you've worked with to do a campaign like this that we can benchmark ourselves against? I mean, we have Los Colinas, but it's theirs has been more um, project based, so promoting their um, holiday stuff or they were trying to build up their um, e-newsletter subscriber list. Um, they don't really do, they also have a marketing director mm -hmm. that handles a lot of that kind of boots on the ground um, with the, the various hotels and businesses within Las Colinas. Mm -hmm. um, so we did do a campaign for them that was um, called Waiting, um, of basically come back, you know, COVID's over, come back. Um, but that again, wasn't more of awareness, it's just, you know, we're still here, come back. Mm -hmm. um, so. This is a unique one because it's a brand new brand. Yeah. Um, yes. We are working with College Station right now to build awareness because they're trying to do get people to drive um, and extend their stay and not, you know, it's kind of like we're not targeting two hours around, but we're targeting two to four hours, <coughs> two to four, you know, five hours out um, in order to get people to come to the things that they have and, and extend their stay. So, but the reason that that is like while we're working with us at College Station 
it's not apples to apples because they have different budget and they sure. have a very different target audience. Sure. And their brand is a little bit You know, worse. like last year we were targeting um, uh, DMAs around uh, teams, SEC teams that would be coming to visit. So it's just, it's really apples to oranges. Um, we've done a lot of uh, destination and tourism marketing, but nothing that is like exactly like this. Like we did visit Austin, but no comparison. There was right? already a brand established. So. Thank you all very much. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> Brianna's Amazing. next, but tell College Station that they need to tell their hotels to quit charging a thousand dollars a night. Right. Hotel. <laughs> right. We, we no, we no. <laughs> right. Okay, Brianna. Yes. No. Thank you all so much for being here because it helped answer a lot of questions. And I think to piggyback on the question because I have that too, as far as length of time. Let me let me get a little bit more granular. So, for example, I know that they're we're running an ad at movie theaters for I don't know select movie theaters. I happen to see it right, and so that was a good thing, right? Um, so I was like, yay, that our our money is is working. But <clears throat> at the same time, we don't have a lot of people going to movies. I actually don't know what that looks like. I know that in that particular movie, there weren't a lot of people, and there's just a lot of other options. I guess from the length of time question is, at what point do you pivot to say, um, like, are we are we like working with the the location where you're at or what you're where you're doing the ad to say, are we really <coughs> reaching enough people, the right people, and maybe we need to pivot sooner rather than later? So that is when you saw the ad, it's. That is a what we call a programmatic buy, and so okay. it is based on um, it's the tracking that we all have on our phones. Unfortunately, um, it's kind of scary. Um, so it, it was served there um, because whoever was in that theater likely fit that target audience. Um, and so you're going to have times where maybe an ad was shown. I'm making this up to 20 people in a theater, but then it may be at a mall with you know a thousand people so it, it's going where the people are um, versus calling a mall and saying i need i need yeah. an ad in this particular yeah. spot or uh, calling for your channel outdoor and saying i want this billboard on 635. Um, that's not really a great use of the funds these days yeah. um, and so the rotation across um, the various um, venues would be um, again, based on those target audiences. Now, as far as shifting, um, if we look and say, you know, let's just say we do a brand awareness or a perception study, and most people are saying, well, I don't really pay attention to, or I didn't pay attention to the ad that was at the convenience store. Well, then we, we may look at another way, um, another avenue when it comes for next year to then look at that. But as far as the media metrics that I was showing, um, we were all in the green. And so it's one of those things that you have to let it ramp up a little bit, and then you don't want to you know, make a decision or <coughs> shift too quickly. Um, but that's, we're certainly, when we end on the 29th, um, that's when we take that, because it was a short enough time frame um, for us to then say, we're not going to make major changes until after it's over. Um, so we want some good learnings. Um, so I hope that answers your question. No, yeah, it does. Okay. Thank you. And I and will then, say, although you can't click on an out of home board, these are digital, so we did put a QR code in there, and thank you for the resurgence of the QR code. Um, wherever those make sense, we're putting them in there. So that is hopefully driving people more traffic to y'all's website. And then the other thing, speaking of websites, so, um, and I may have missed this in the presentation, so apologies if I did, but um, I know that you've got kind of like industry standards, we seem to be exceeding industry standards and where we are with our numbers of number of reach per like on the websites and other areas. <clears throat> How do we account for, I don't know, the delta margin of error for people who are multiple visitors, right? Like, like how do we know that like Don probably clicked a hundred times because he just wanted to go look at it a hundred okay. times, right? <laughs> and so Don can't be doing. I know, right? We have someone on staff who just visits y'all's website. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. But how do how do we account for that in our numbers? So I mean, we look. We can look at analytics and see um, how many. Um, <laughs> how many sessions of the website based on the clicks from the paid advertising and look how many sessions there were. So you have unique numbers and then you have your 
um, just basically cumulative numbers. So whenever I was showing you that 781,000 in reach, those were unique reach. Okay, uh, those are unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, perfect, thank you. And then the impressions are what is not unique. So that's why you look at reach and impressions separately. And then looking at budget, one of the other questions that we had was based on the money that we had allocated for phase one, I guess, or the initial phases, <coughs> the amount that's already been spent and there's, there's a request for going forward, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's still money left from the initial amount. Um, and I'm curious on what the plan is for, or has it already been spent? It has. It has. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're ready for the next phase. Yes. <laughs> we squeezed it dry. Yeah. Okay. We no, put I put it all to work. Yes. Okay. The other thing too was you talked about like okay we're not just looking at the farmers market right we're mm -hmm. looking at other areas like have you guys already thought about what the next step is for where you would take pictures what you would yeah. do right like we've done farmers market I guess Old Town mm -hmm. the Trinity River like have you guys already started to look at what the next we, phase looks like we did so in phase one what we did was make a kind of a wish list or we call it a shot list and then once we started interviewing photographers and having them scope that out it was basically what can we afford can we afford a one-day shoot a two-day shoot okay we afforded a two-day shoot how many different locations can we fit in there so we, we were scrappy and we made six work um, so from that shot list, I want to say we originally mapped out maybe a dozen, 14. I cannot remember off the top of my head, but yes, we, we did back pocket those. Like, we're going to come back to these. Um, and that is something that we are working with Ellie and team on to make sure that we are shooting the locations that we most want to prioritize. Thank you. Don, Don, and then Mark. Uh, can you go to the, the results? Um, <clears throat> Uh, one more. Yeah, that one there. Um, I know you said we're a little bit of an outlier. I'm just curious, do you have any idea? Like, I'm just going to pick this value, the first one on value. Mm -hmm. So the benchmark is 50 cents, but we're at 3 cents. So it looks like we're blowing it out of the water, yeah. if, if I read that correctly, right? Yeah. Is there, do you have any thoughts about why that would be? Is the, are we an anomaly? Because our that, campaign's is, really great. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides the obvious, I mean, I knew that was the obvious answer. But beyond that, um, or is the benchmark wrong? Are we just no, weird? I mean, what do you have any thoughts about? Yeah, so um, we'll start at the quality. So the, the um, audio completion rate, um, and then you've got cost per um, audio completion. So where you see that we most people are listening to the spot to mm -hmm. completion, which is why... Um, it's three cents versus fifty cents. Okay. It's not always at the the same um, percentage um, separation. Yeah. Um, but the impressions that are being delivered, ninety five percent, the completion rate is ninety five percent. So when people are listening to it, it's only costing you three cents. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, to to it all the way and it's, it, it does. It's not a rabbit hole we need to necessarily get down. Yeah. I was just, uh, I was just a little bit because you know it's the whole thing. A benchmark doesn't really matter if you're so far off, right? Yeah. It, it's not really telling you anything exactly. if you right. if if you're not, right. you know, it's not measuring anything. Right. It doesn't have any teeth. So that's. I was just curious. I was trying to well, understand honestly, a little bit more. And honestly, um, we're seeing in the last couple of years, we're seeing much better um, results with streaming audio mm -hmm. because we don't have to cherry pick which platforms we're on anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it's going underneath that programmatic umbrella that I was explaining earlier about it's following the person versus I think my target listens to Spotify based mm -hmm. on some syndicated research that was done by Nielsen. Yeah. Um, this yeah. time it's, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, everybody's ones and zeros that are tagged on their phones and know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So um, we are seeing, um, you know, even though it's still considered a, um, a industry standard again it's industry standard I would have for instance lost cleanest that benchmark may have been mm -hmm. a ninety percent but they're an established brand okay yeah so yeah okay okay just trying to understand yeah. it as all thanks yep. Mark uh, yeah so uh, just piggybacking on Brianna's question um, you know, the, the city has several very valuable assets that are part of the overall package in <coughs> Discovering Coppell. 
and I'm wondering, are we going to be uh, prominently featuring the like the Arts Center and the Biodiversity Center in future um, ads? I want to say the Arts Center may have been one that we originally put on our shot list, but what we wouldn't want to do is duplicate efforts. So if the Arts Center is running their own campaign, we wouldn't want to use our funds if it wasn't necessary. And also their campaigns, I, I, I believe, are going to be a little bit different in nature, where they are specifically promoting events, like right. come see this show. And so we can certainly do that. If that is a priority, we are happy to take that feedback. But it is something that I would ask you know, to be mindful of, is that we're not spending money yeah. on something if there are already decent efforts put to that. Well, here's my fear, is that we're not going to have enough things for dis um, discovering Capel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the theater is, is, a, is a fantastic thing. You may not say, you know, come see this particular um, event mm -hmm. that, that they're um, having, but just the fact that we have a theater where sure. we can have performances, or the Biodiversity Center where they've got all sorts of interesting weekend things that you can do. The Biodiversity Center, it was on our list, um, and I can't remember why we selected certain ones that we did. That one was certainly on the list uh, for this next year. Now, I, I realize that's, you know, it's not necessarily part of the Chamber of Commerce, but it's part of the overall package which makes Capel interesting. Sure. And, and that's a fair concern, and I appreciate that you're saying that, because we do want to be realistic. We have to have this conversation with College Station all the time. You cannot position yourself as a huge metropolis, because you are not. People are escaping metropolitans to come to College Station for a reason, so we have to be authentic with how we position ourselves. So I appreciate like, your awareness with that, and we certainly want to help with um, you know, showcasing the things that are discoverable. You're welcome. John? Let's see if I can phrase this right. Kind of going, going off what Mark was saying, you mentioned repeatedly about um, the size of a capel and what we have. We're not lost cleanliness, we're not Addison, and so on. So, is there an expectation as to a certain point, this is the peak, this is the max that we're going to get to, that you have an idea as to this is it? We're not, no matter what we do, with what we have here, this is all you're going to get. Is that, do you have an idea as to that? That I feel like, does that feel similar to like what we were talking about with Kevin earlier? Like, and there, there's not really a hard hitting answer to that. Um, I mean, well, as long as y'all feel the need to get your message out and have a marketing campaign, we are happy to support you. Now we can look at the results of our campaign and if they're dwindling, then we can look at how we optimize that, whether it's a new campaign, you know, which happens all the time. We wouldn't change your, your brand identity, right? We wouldn't suddenly be visit Coppell with a new logo. We would say discover Coppell and we'd maybe look at freshening up the campaign. Um, but to say like, hey, we think you're done, you're not gonna get any more, that would really, you know, those numbers and those types of um, goals that y'all are wanting to meet would be something that y'all would provide us. And then we would tell you how we can help you meet that. Or we don't, you know, we don't think that's something that we can help with. We think you should um, leverage community relations for that. Because it's great you get the, I guess, the number of clicks and you get, mm -hmm. you know, the results and so on. But like what everyone was talking about, we just don't know how to measure our return. And, right. You know, and that's the key. And, and you talked about people maybe clicking and then going to the website of Capel, we don't know what part they, they're actually browsing from that connection, you know, from your, uh, from we, your links. I'm, I'm saying, we can dive into, we can okay. dive into analytics and, and pull which that, pages have been most um, viewed or seem to be people are engaging with a little okay. bit more. And, and from that, if it's a particular, whether it's a farmer's market or something, I'm just trying to see how do we measure that from the point where before we actually had the uh, Discover Capel campaign and people are clicking the million, you know, whatever, and then how, do that, how does that equate to people actually visiting? Taking action. 
Well, and that's where that kind of benchmark gets set. So if the farmer's market has that data or hotels or, um, you know, where you go and kayak and all these different things, if they have that and then we look at a year over year um, to see when the campaign went into market and was there an increase in sales or traffic or growth. It's to see that, that the needle was moved um, in a positive direction as soon as something hit the market. That would be really the only thing that we can do without doing that um, perception study that she was talking about. So we would need that information from you know, the powers that be on your site. So. And the second question you mentioned about the advertising, advertising could be any outdoor, <coughs> right? What determines the location or what, what, what is it that you're looking for that, you, that determines where? Because I think we asked about where do we advertise, but we didn't know where. Mm -hmm. It just happens that she was at the theater I, I and mean, she saw yeah. it, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's based on those target audiences that we were showing. So um, if you fit, and we can send, um, I don't know how deep um, our strategist went in to explaining the different personas that she had created, um, but we can send that information. But it's based on all of their behaviors, basically that definition of that target audience. So if it's an on-the-go family that fits that adults 35 to 49, um, and they're always on the go. They, um, you know, have kids playing soccer. They have, um, they're in these schools. Whatever the case may be, that defines that. Um, if they are frequenting this gas station, then that's where that ad's going to go. Um, so that's where that location targeting comes in, and yeah. the tracking of the scary tracking that are all on our phones. For, is that answering your question? Because yeah. I know that this, this programmatic out of home is rather new to the industry. Um, so it's different, as Cassie was mentioning earlier, than like when we go say we want to buy, we want to place a buy with this movie theater and our ad is always going to run in that theater. We would not do that for you because that is not an efficient use of your funds. So again, this programmatic, it's, it's just like your phone. You get served up a banner. You might be um, browsing a website, and because of the context of it, you might get served an ad that feels relevant. It's kind of the same with this out of home buy. Well, that we, we can have. give an example of our creative director um, that Daryl had told you. Yeah. Well, but that then veers off the out of home, and I well, want to make sure that the out of home is the clear concept for you. is the same as far as who it's targeting. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay, our our colleague who actually helped. Uh, developed the campaign. Um, he's no longer at Belmont, but he texted me the other night. He's like, look, I've got served up an ad. And I was like, perfect. We're about to go to the city council meeting. Tell me what, what you were doing. So he was reading a food blog, and he got served up the ad with the barbecue. And he said, but prior to that, I had been Googling things to do this weekend. So you can see he Googled things to do. The cookies followed him. Then the next time he was on a website that was relevant, um, contextually relevant, he then gets served up the hard eight banner. So that's just kind of a real life example of how it works. Um, and so the Alma Home is very similar to that. So, so maybe as a follow up to that, what is the um, what are the banners that are out there that could be served up to people? Sure. Oh, we've got a sample of those. Here. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, okay, oh, so this is okay. digital display, but again, this is just a sample. So these come in like a, an array of sizes. So whatever site a size needs, they'll, they'll uh, serve this up. But these are the two versions that we have right now that are digital display banners. Okay. And then again, quick look at paid social. And then this, these are some of our outcome boards. I didn't put all of them in here. It would have been too cumbersome. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. You're um, the other question I had was um, a couple of times you've mentioned, and I think rightfully so, it's right, like we will do whatever you tell us to, based on your strategy, right? Do you feel like you have clarity on the strategy for Capel currently to move forward in the additional phases <coughs> that have been laid out? Mm -hmm. I think we. Or do you okay. feel like you need more direction? Because then we need to know what we need to sure. do. Well, for 2023, the there will certainly have to be a planning conversation, um, whether it's we stay the course 
and we make optimizations that we can deduce based on how our media is performing, or if there are any um, strategic goals that are going to change, we'll certainly have a conversation with Ellie about that and look at how we optimize that. So I can't say we're crystal clear on 2023, but we would also be completely happy going, great, your strategic initiatives um, have not changed, we're going to stay the course. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You answered a lot of questions that we had from our last meeting. My question is, you know, Coppel is bordering with the DFW, one of the busiest airport in the world. Uh, what's your thoughts around advertising, getting those transit passengers or tourists coming to Dallas, Fort Worth area? So extending your geography outside of DFW or outside of the state? Like in the passengers the were coming to, to, the to the airport. airport. To the airport. Um, Do you have any on that? I mean, that, so that's a different, completely different objective. That's, um, if they've already booked, they're here, they just got to the airport, they've already booked a hotel. Or um, if they already have an itinerary, then it would be getting them to change that itinerary. Um, so if they're in market, they're going to be getting ads anyway. So that's more of a messaging um, thing that would then have to be. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not necessarily a media targeting thing, but it's a message thing because they would geographically be served up our ad. Um, but I mean, if you wanted to try and get on people's radars before they actually get here and book their itinerary, then that's changing your whole geo target and that takes a lot more money because then you're spreading out that geo. And again, we want to be realistic with what we're trying to achieve. Um, can I build on that answer for you at all? If, I'm, if, if I'm, you need more clarity, please let me know. Well, one of the reasons I asked, we have a barber, um, Shelby, he's a small business person <coughs> here in Coppell. Once he told me that people who are waiting in transit calls him to go to a local barber shop in Coppell, mm -hmm. and he gets visits from people who are, you know, visiting at the airport. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where I was going with, how do we get those people who are waiting in airport? Mm -hmm. A long wait, six hours, eight sure. hours, they have to do over. something. Mm -hmm. So know, one of the uh, things that we can do from a targeting standpoint is when people get to the airport, um, again, it's scary, but there's credit card data. Um, <laughs> uh, there's data yeah. everywhere, yeah. <laughs> there's credit card data that can um, say, you know, if they have spent, uh, bought an airline ticket to Dallas um, in the last, you know, week. Um, and so then we could serve up an ad that is talking about, hey, while you're here, check out Coppell. So again, it goes more to the messaging side, and then we can kind yeah. of um, tweak one of the parameters within our target yeah. audiences. So come discover Coppell is a completely different message than, hey, if you need a haircut while you're here and waiting. Like that's a whole different message and a whole different campaign, and probably would be best served by the people providing those services rather than getting people to come discover all that there is. Because <clears throat> you want them to come back. Right. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Well, I got to reinforce uh, a friend of mine and his wife were at a movie and they saw the ad and then they came and asked me and I had to explain to them in detail what we were doing. So, you know, it, it was, for them it was effective, so. Good. Next time just nice on speed dial. <laughs> Erica and Cassie, can you explain that? Okay, y'all thanks again for Thank you very much. wonderful yeah. questions. We're so appreciative. Okay, we got Ellie back up. Thank you very much. Yes. Ellie, do you want us to sit tight? Yes, yes. all right. Just to have an additional question. All right. Yes. Thank you guys so much. That was so helpful to all of us. Um, and so now what I want to talk to y'all about is what we plan on doing in 2023 based on conversations that we've had with Belmont. Um, you know, it took us these last, what, 11 months to establish the brand and get the, the campaign going. Um, and so in 2023, moving forward, we're going to continue that advertising, as you saw, looking at the results and tweaking it based on what the, those results are. Like, for instance, we saw that, you know, the, um, the uh, uh, older grandparents are spending a lot more time and, and they they're seem to be responding more to our ads than the active enthusiasts. Um, so we're going to, again, continue the marketing as it is for now, tweaking it based on what these reports tell us 
Um, we have a regular website now, as they spoke of, and, and I think I've shared that with y'all. Um, we have a person that uh, keeps that updated on a regular daily basis, and she stays in constant contact with the city on anything that y'all have going on that we need to, to add to the, um, to the website. Um, one of the things that the chamber will be adding this year, because, you know, hotel occupancy tax is about hotel occupancy. And so while we're creating awareness of, of, for the people that are in the Metroplex, or North Texas actually, because it's all through North Texas, um, our goal is, is to, again, get people to come and visit and go. But we also want to be able to take advantage of, you know, p these big... Uh, manufacturing firms that are here, these corporate headquarters, um, these uh, Fortune 500 companies that do a lot of uh, training with their employees. For instance, Vary, I know we'll bring in 50 new employees at a time. Um, and we don't want them to send them to Grapevine or Irving to stay. We want those employees to stay here and go help. So what we believe will be highly effective, and that's part of our conversion when you were talking about the chamber taking over certain parts, um, we will have a staff member that will be meeting with these businesses. And I do want to emphasize <coughs> we're not looking at just chamber member businesses. That's completely separate from Discover Coppell. That is all, that are, this is all the businesses that are here in Coppell that fit that demographic. And we will make sure, we'll be visiting with them and make sure that they know that if they're doing a conference, if they're doing an event, if they're doing a program where they need hotels for a weekend or a week, please use Coppell. We now have the website to drive them to. Um, we now have materials to hand out to them. Um, and we now have the brand that we can share with them. And so that will be part of our focus in 2023. Um, so we'll be doing those on-site visits with them. Um, we'll be uh, promoting Discover Coppell and the uses of using our hotels. Uh, and we're we'll trying to get that in both the city newsletter and it will be in the Coppell Chamber newsletter. Um, and um, we do want to, we talked about what additional places, so this is something that we have already talked with um, Belmont about is those additional places that we would like to add to our marketing. And so doing an additional photo shoot to freshen up those, the, those graphics and our branding. Um, and of course, we're gonna be presenting quarterly reports to you guys on the success of, of our program and, and where we are. Um, and, and again, this is just kind of a recap of what they've already talked to you about, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, but this, uh, the last time I know there were a lot of questions about exactly what are you going to be spending this money on. So we broke it down for you a little bit more. So you see that paid media, and, and again, this is just February through September, and then I'll be back probably, um, what, August to say, okay, we're ready for the funding from October to October, because that's when what your budget runs. So we're trying to get it in line with the, the city's budget. And so, um, so what we're asking for is only from February through September. And, um, and the way our agreement works with Belmont is, is once we say, okay, this is how much money we have to spend, then they, they will determine, okay, this is how much money we're going to spend here and how much we're going to spend there. So what they gave me was an estimate based on what we think we'll be doing in 2023. Um, and so the eight months of advertising, and this is what's included in that advertising, and then the agency services and creative production, um, you know, $18,000 of that goes actually to the photo shoot itself. And, and then there's the, uh, <coughs> or excuse me, 30000 of what it costs us to do with all of it and the development from that and then paying the agency for their management. And then the contractor management f through to the chamber itself, that covers the person that actually does all the website and management for our for Discover Coppell and a, a chamber staff person that will be doing these hotel, um, excuse me, meetings with the hotels and with the corporations and companies in Coppell um, <coughs> together. So that's, what all, that's the breakout of what all of the request is. And this is the total funds that we're requesting right now, again, from February through September 23. Anybody have questions? Brianna. Hey, Ellie, so remind me, the contractor management, that's for, when the 12%, that's for you, right? That's for the chamber itself, but it's for the management of Discover Coppell, again, both the website and the staff and all of that. 
Okay, but that was that was going to be your position going forward, or, or you were going to work on that going forward? Right now, it'll be someone that we already have on staff that'll be doing that, but our goal is eventually to move to that separate, and like I said, we'll, we'll come back with that, and we've already talked to Belmont about that, that we will actually hire a full-time person that will be employed by Discover Coppell. Okay, and then the second question I have for clarity is when we're, um, everything here is, I guess it is from the top, everything here is just for February to September. Just from February okay. through September. and then you'll yes. come back. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Kevin? Kevin? Um, so I do have to ask, uh, so in the initial uh, ask, the contractor management fee was 10%, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And it's moved to 12%. Uh, can you tell us why the increase? Um, again, because we'll have that additional role of being out actually meeting face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> the first phase was just the management of it, and it also pays for Cindy, who, man who mm -hmm. developed and managed the, manages the website and will continue to do so, but now we're adding a, 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 a role where someone will be actually out there. And so that will be able to give, in, in answer to um, Councilman June's question, that itself will be able to give a little bit of hard number saying, okay, we've met with so-and-so companies, organizations, and that'll be part of your report. And these people actually used us, or the Lions Club called us and they want to use us for a conference. We've had those sort of phone calls or you know nations baseball calls and they want to do their tournament and okay they're going to use Coppell. We'll be able to give you those sorts of things as far as events that have been booked here because of our efforts. But again that's only a part-time person <coughs> at this point that will be doing that. So let me follow up on that too because that was my question last time the 10 to 12 percent. So um, you're saying bring on someone at one time First you said full-time, now you're saying part, so a part-time It'll be, person? It'll eventually be a full-time position, but right now what you're looking at is part-time, and it'll probably be someone that's already on our staff. But the chamber, you know, is of course, we're paying a person to go right. out and do this. We, we are, you know, doing all the photocopying and, and all of the office management and all of that stuff, so that's part of that 12% plus managing Cindy, and we do all the meetings once a month or once a week, depending on what's going on <laughs> with Belmont and all of that. So it's right. not just... Where they're doing just focus on Coppell versus it is all the other... just on Influence Discover Coppell. And, and the reason I ask for clarity on that is because then we know we will see that recurring fee going forward for you to be able to maintain that person. Yes, that will continue. And, and so if at any point we say no, right, then that that position is That position eliminated. goes away, okay. yeah. Um, so it, there will, it, whether it's a contractor management fee or whether it becomes a whole separate entity fee, gotcha. you will always have to pay for someone that manages oversight of all of this. So if the position, like she was talking about, if the position goes away, the <coughs> Discover Capel campaign, how does it go on? Yeah. Well, it, we would hope that you don't do that. <laughs> but if, if the, that, cause that so are we funding totally for that particular that part, no, you're not totally reliant. You're, you're reliant on that person to make sure that that this program is being uh, overseen, that there is someone that is managing the task force that is meeting with Belmont Ice House that is um, uh, making sure that our social media is being updated and all that. We don't do the updates, but we manage it. Right now, it's currently me that is um, managing all of this stuff I'm talking about. So it's not like y'all are handing money and Belmont's just going out and doing it. There is a person there that is managing getting all of this stuff done and manage getting, hiring them, bring, getting the website uh, person on board and getting the website developed and all of that. That is currently happening and has been happening and that's what that 10% is for. The reason we went with 12% is because when you take away a chamber staff member's time to go out and do these calls, then you're taking time away from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so we have to cover the expenses of having to re I had to add a full-time person um, back a couple of months ago because we've taken this part on and we had a part-time person, now I need her full-time so that we can do this part. So she mentioned that's an expected recurring expense. It is, is an that, expected recurring expense. Is that an, is that an expense that's gonna increase? 
If we add it as a full-time person that their sole job is just doing that, then yes, it will go up. If we keep it like it is now, then it'll stay like it is. And we do that percentage based on how much money we need for advertising and all that stuff. That was the only way we could figure out the best way to, to calculate that. So, or how big the campaign is. But um, if, if we decide that this is, this is going to be a full-time person and that person's going to always be in that position, then that is going to go up. And, and again, right now we base that position on how much, how big the campaign is and how much work is involved in the campaign. So with that 12% fee right now, mm -hmm. you said it's part-time position well, basically. So Currently it is, yeah. Okay, so what, what are we talking about? The hours that they spend on this? I can't give you 100% what Cindy, the the website manager, spends on it. I can tell you that, I mean, again, she's it's constantly updated. And, and again, she can give you all that data as far as how many hits you get on your website and all that stuff. So she's constantly updating it. Because every time the city adds something that we're doing, she's adding it to that. She's constantly, we keep a list of all the things to do in restaurants and hotels and all that. So hers is kind of almost a daily thing where she's looking at that and saying, okay, do we need to pull this business off, add this business to it, pull this event off because it's over, add this one to it. So that's a constant daily update, just like the city's website itself. Um, other than ours, it's just focused on Discover Coppell. So she is always doing that. As far as my role right now, I've been... 50% of my time over the last two weeks has been on getting, well, gosh, since we had our last meeting, has been on getting this information and getting with them and getting all the data uh, for you guys for this next meeting. We typically meet weekly or talk weekly, give me some updates, let's look at where we are, what we're doing. Um, and then again, there's paperwork, there's meetings, there's committee meetings um, with, we have a task force and all of that that we're constantly talking with and meeting on a regular basis. I can't give you an exact number, but um, I would say probably 10 to 12 hours a week of my time is on Discover Cup Health. Um, if not more than that, depending on like something like this where we've spent you know, a tremendous amount of time on gathering new information. Um, with adding the in-person meetings, where, like I said, we, we really need that. Right now, the hotels have been all been out. They're trying to market themselves individually, and there needs to be one cohesive person that's kind of the intercessor between the hotels and the corporations that are here and say, okay. And the chamber already has a relationship with a lot of them, but there's a lot of them that we don't. Um, but the hotels do. So collaborating with them and saying, okay, we now, the city is now funding to have a person that's going to talk to these businesses on your behalf so you don't have to be out there going door to door like they have been, um, then that's what that person will be doing. And that might be two or three hours a week. It might be 10 hours a week. Um, but again, right now the chamber staff is, is handling that part of it. Our goal again, once we get the, get the funding in place and the fitting in place, is to have a person that is just full time on staff just to do that. Last question. You might have mentioned this, but um, I know that, like hotel, when people are there, they're already here. Mm -hmm. But are we doing anything to the people that are at the hotel, for example? Are we doing anything to promote Discover Cup you know, Hell, whether it be a QR code for them to kind of look? Because there's a lot of surrounding, you know restaurants and places for them to visit, but for them to focus on in Capel, is, is it, are we doing something with, is Chamber doing something with that? Did, we've had conversations with all of them about Discover Capel and it's now in place, and, and but <laughs> as far as actually having any, any QR codes in their lobbies or anything like that, we do not yet. I have met with Four Points, you know, and, and talked with them about you know putting some sort of sign in the lobby with the QR code you know if it's on their digital displays and things like that we have not started that but there has been conversation about that okay I've got Kevin and then Don and then Bijou just uh, really quick so part of the um, the the person that's going to be like this contract management they're going to be responsible I, I know you talked about the quarterly reports that you were going to provide to council 
Um, I'm assuming that they will be reporting <coughs> the economic impact that they're able to track in terms of like this is you know this event came because of Discover Coppell this you know this this hotel had this thing when we're going to get a copy of all that correct that'll be in with your report now the the results you know like what what uh, Belmont shared tonight that will come from them yes but we will be able to give you a list of okay we met with these organizations and hey they booked it yes you know that sort of stuff so, we will so, be able to tell you that so again that's one thing that you I can't tell you exactly you know what sure. the results are of it but we can tell you that we met with them talked with them and okay you know uh, container store is going to do their annual convention here but, yeah as far as and you know, Belmont, some of that that awareness campaign piece is kind of nebulous in terms of like not being able to really get that. But with somebody on set, they'll be able to report, yeah, like tangible dollars slash economic impact that that came to Coppell. So we'll be able to get some results and reporting based on that piece. Re regarding the hotels, if we met yes. with them and they stayed in the hotel, we'll be able to give you that tangible. Excellent. Yes, Thank you. I can't tell you what restaurants they ate in and stuff like that, but we can tell you those. Don, remind me some of the, the legal logistics here. The contract with Belmont is with the chamber, mm -hmm. is that correct? Not yes. with the city. So how the city. does it work? The city has a contract with the chamber. Mm -hmm. Is that how that works? Right. And so, and so it's a sort of base day grant the, or? Yes, the, the mayor was asking me this earlier. Uh, because the current contract ends on the 29th, mm -hmm. we started this discussion to give us time to get the amended contract for the chamber on the agenda if this is something you want to continue to do. <coughs> if you decide that you don't want to do it, don't amend the contract. Okay. And it just ends all this <coughs> way on the 29th. And then um, who owns the collateral items or the brand or any of that stuff? Does the chamber own it? Does Belmont Discover, own it? Discover, Discover Coppell. Coppell who yeah, we who have owns a, all that stuff? Discover Coppell owns it. Um, okay. And and so right now that lady. yeah and the, right now that falls under our jurisdiction, but it, it's actually um, it there, belongs to Discover Coppell. Is there a legal entity, uh, Discover Coppell? Is that a there is one? not at this point. Okay, no. but it's, it's, so it's, it's really a subsidy under the Chamber of Commerce. Okay, so yeah. the Chamber owns all the. Whatever marketing items are out there, yeah. the assets and all that, that actually is owned by the chamber. I guess that would be the legal owned. term. Okay. Yeah, the client owns all the legal assets and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, B2. Mm -hmm. um, how much did we spend um, total up to a year? Hundred and it's a hundred and fifty thousand towards the campaign itself, um, and that included website development and all of um, Belmont's work, and then. The chamber received fifteen thousand, which paid for again oversight and management. <coughs> okay, so if I, if your ask is approved, two hundred and twenty-four plus one hundred and seventy-five or seven. No, it's just two twenty-four for right now. Yeah, the yeah. one we already spent is one hundred and sixty-five. We total. have spent the whole one hundred sixty-five because all the all the funds have been spent on advertising. So yeah, they we give them an amount. This is how much money we have to spend, and they allocated accordingly so yeah it, it'll all be spent by the end of or it's already all spent okay so <laughs> if you approve this today it would be a total three hundred and eighty five thousand dollars for the full campaign for a year um, started last January well we, we got work. funding in Jan in February of last year of so, yeah y'all y'all approved it in January sorry. and we got funding in February so that's why it runs out the end Almost of January two years. so it's 12 it's a 12 month that two was, fiscal years yeah right yeah, you already answered my question, question to Kevin's question is, you will be providing us a report orally on what's going on. With what's going on, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brianna? So piggybacking on the budget, because that's what I was trying to understand, and I missed some numbers as I was like focusing on the other question you had. Um, but maybe this is for Belmont as well, but... Um, like amount that was spent in the beginning, which usually you think there's probably a lot of overhead and just right a lot of time and effort, and then going forward, right? Like there's only only so much within Capel that you can do. So will this amount eventually go down for us to keep doing what we're doing, or will it go up, or will it be about the same? Like. I would love to understand. Based on what I'm understanding, and I, and I know that Erica can come in behind this, it really depends. I mean, it, it, 
we should eventually, be, if we spend enough time doing this, then we establish our brand. And we don't have to do as much promoting of the brand. Um, but we may say, hey, you know, we, we just built a new art center and now we want to spend some money on promoting that. You'll still spend money. It really depends on what your target is. And, and, and I can let you go behind me if you want to elaborate. Yeah, and I hope I don't sound like a broken record. No. It will totally depend on like what your goals and objectives are. Okay. And so like with this amount, we really were looking at, well, we had 150000 to work with last year. This is how we spent it. Um, and, we, and, you know, we only... We were developing the campaign, but we only ran that media for two to three months. And so looking at wanting to be able to build off of that. The worst thing you want to do is like put all this money into developing a campaign and then it sits on the shelf. Great. So we want to make sure that it at least gets leveraged and used and then we can make some informed decisions on where to go. Okay, and that's helpful because last time I think too there was a conversation around like photos and it was like well, we'll refresh photos what does that look like and you even said well like we're only using so many but we took x number right mm -hmm. so what is that what is how does all that fit in i'm just trying to understand the the details around it so um so that's helpful to know depending on our strategy um and then i'll i'll just i think one is talking about strategy but the other one is that I would love, I, I don't know, maybe it's to you, right, is that if we could potentially revisit the agreement if we decide to go forward from the standpoint of the chamber being a, so technically it's like a work for hire, right, like we're subcontracting this out to Belmont as a work for hire. If that's the case, then the city should own the assets. Um, and maybe I got that wrong, but it's what I do for a living. So if y'all can revisit that, that would be great. No, me. Thank you. And and we're fine with either one. I mean, yeah, it's I just, just uh, I guess legally right now because we're the contractor then and we're the client for them, then we own the assets. Right, right. But our agreement is with you. So Correct. again, I don't want to get into the. I don't want to put on my lawyer hat right now. But <laughs> I will say I would love for our lawyer to revisit that. We could probably that update. was actually surprising for me. Yeah, we right could now. probably update the contract to say that since you're funding yeah, this. I'll, thing. I'll let Hager, Hager do that. So as it stands now, this will be on the agenda at the next regular council meeting on the twenty fourth for approval. <coughs> actually, that's the question. <laughs> as I'm, not, I'm not making unless, an assumption. It's on oh, the agenda. Oh. <laughs> So, do you want to see the do you want to see this on the agenda on the twenty fourth? Well, because the agreement expires on the 29th. That's yeah. correct. So it has to be on the twenty fourth. Well, yes, that's the logic. Okay. No, I'm just I'm just saying I'm just trying. Well, to Well, no, as as yeah. Mike said, if you want to proceed, got one yes, one yes. Well, you know we we spent all this money to build the machine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need to fuel it, yes. at least for a while, to yes. see if it works. That's true. Well, yeah, that's why my thumb yes. is up, because well, initial investments made. I was yeah. listening to her comment, you know, probably that 133000 up there is the best money we're going to spend. Because that's actually putting what we've been developing into effect, into use. You know, the, the preliminary three months uh, uh, results are looking very promising. And you know, this, I'm 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 intrigued with the AI, the artificial intelligence that's going into the the sampling and who the, is targeted is scary, but it looks like it's very effective. And, and I I agree too. I mean, we've made an investment, and I would say it, it should be on the agenda. But I'm I'm not going to say yay or nay only because I'm not here on the 24th, and so I will not be. Okay. So. You okay on the agenda? Absolutely. John? Yeah. Kevin? Yeah. John? Mm -hmm. John? Biju? Yeah. Mark? Okay. Bob, you okay well, with the agenda? You don't get hooked. <laughs> I know. Thankfully. <laughs> uh, do you want this ownership of FL? I do, but you know what? It has to be at the will of the council. So. I, mean, well, I know what you want. I, yeah. I, I, I need and I. I mean, I'll be honest, change. I feel like we're paying for it, so my opinion is we ought to own exactly. it. Exactly, it's a work for hire. I thought Ellie said it. I do too. Ellie said she didn't care, so. Because, yeah. because at we'll some point, point if and when, right, if, if for whatever reason the chamber goes away or something changes, 
we should be able to take that on as a city. We're not going away. <laughs> I, I know, and that's fine, but I'm just saying. But <laughs> no, we're not going away. Okay. So, thank you very much. Okay. I think we've got our answer going forward. Thank you. Um, Item D is actually something for out in the future. We can handle that at the next meeting, so we'll defer that to later. The time is 728 and a half. Sorry, We're at the end of work session. We'll move into the council chambers for the regular session at 735. Uh, recess from work session and we are going to rejoin the regular session of the city council at 735 in about five minutes. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. The time is 7.37 p.m., and we're going to move into the regular session of the Coppell City Council. Just as a reminder, persons to week, uh, speak during our citizens' appearance or the public hearings must sign the appropriate register outside the council chambers and list your residence address. We do have uh, two separate public hearings and, of course, our citizens' appearance tonight. Uh, Mr. William Rose from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is here to give the invocation and then please remain standing while we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Rose. Dear Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for this amazing and beautiful day today and thankful for this great community and city we live in and please bless all those who were able to arrive tonight that they may be able to get home safely and all have a great rest of the night tonight and please bless that those who are participating that they will be able to come to a good choice on whatever the matter may be and thankful for those who are leading this meeting and please bless that they will all be able to have inspiration from thee, and we say these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Item number five on our agenda is a presentation by the Coppell High School Health Occupation Students of America organization. And we have student Sanvi Gadam, I believe, uh, here. Uh, Sanvi? And I'm sorry if I messed up your name. Welcome, and if you would, you know, kindly introduce yourselves before you get started. Hi, so we're going to be presenting about heart health and the Im impact the city has on the heart. My name is Sanvi Gaddam, and presenting with me today is Shriya Midori and Mahika Padki. What is heart health? Nearly 2,400 deaths occur each day from heart disease. It is the least leading cause of death in the United States. Heart health is making healthy choices for your heart and understanding the risk your actions have to the heart and knowing how to reduce the risk of getting heart disease. This is important because your body depends on your heart. Let me explain with this example from the American Heart Association. Think of the heart as the power supply, and without the power supply, nothing else works. The system won't even turn on. Your heart creates actual electoral pulses that run through your body, supplying energy to everything. The thing is, if that power is turned off, everything doesn't just shut down. It starts to die. Oh, you didn't. There are three main symptoms for heart disease. The first one includes heart attack. Signs for this may include discomfort in the chest, upper body, and the neck. That you may also experience physical pain. Things you may feel is heartburn, nausea, vomiting, extreme fatigueness, and dizziness. You may also experience some indigestion as well. The second symptom is arrhythmia. The signs for this may include fluttering feelings in the chest, also known as palpations. Lastly, the third symptom, heart failure. For this, signs may include swelling of the feet, ankles, legs, and your neck veins. A respiratory issue one may, feel, one may face is shortness of breath. If you, know, if you notice any of these signs, please talk to your doctor immediately. There are, many, oh, sorry. there are many causes that can increase your risk for heart disease, one of them being smoking. According to the Center, uh, sorry. According to the Center uh, for Disease Control, nearly 25% of high school students use some kind of tobacco product, and nearly 4,000 kids under 
the age of 18 try their first cigarette every day. If you know someone that smokes, please advise them to please advise them on ways to quit, but in a support in a supportive and friendly manner. Help them figure out the reasons why they should quit, such as living longer, lowering their chances of heart attack, stroke, or cancer, and having more money to spend on things other than cigarettes. Warn them about the dangers of cigarette smoking. The nicotine in cigarettes causes the blood vessels to narrow, making it even harder for blood to flow through the vessels. Another risk to increase your heart to increase your heart to increase the heart disease is high blood pressure. Fewer than three percent of children in the United States have high blood pressure. It is important to maintain a healthy body weight. People who are usually overweight have higher blood pressure rather than people who are not. Body fat can be decreased by increase in physical activity and limiting salt intake. Another risk can also be high cholesterol. Less than 15% of children have high cholesterol levels. By, but studies have shown that fatty plaque buildup begins in childhood and progresses into adulthood. So it's important to be taking care of your body when you're younger. It is important to get a lot of exercise, and, in, and it's encouraged to exercise thir between 30 to 60 minutes on most days of the week. It's important to also eat foods with low cholesterol and fat, and eating more whole grains and fresh fruit and vegetables are also advised. Obesity. One out of every three adults are obese. It is important to control portions, the amount of food being eaten, and calorie intake. We can do this by limit sna limiting snacking options and being aware of the snack foods being eaten, and also increasing physical activity and finding fun exercises to do. A change in lifestyle. The, condition in, the conditions in which people live in work and affect their heart health. Limited access to economic stability, quality of education, and access to health care greatly affects the heart and can raise the risk for health conditions and heart disease. Creating social, creating social physical, and economic envi environments that better heart and well-being is very important. Transitioning to cities to promote Local, li oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, transitioning cities to promote local living and active, um, and active and sustainable mobility is increasingly recognized as providing co-benefits for health and the environment by creating more sustainable and li livable cities. By 2050, three in four people will live in cities where up to 80% of energy is consumed and 70% of greenhouse gases are, li are emitted. Said study author professor Stom, Th Thomas Munzel of the University and Medical Center, Mainz, Germany. There are limited actions that individuals can take to protect themselves from pollutants, so policymakers need to take on this responsibility. Building cities for cars and urban sprawl encourages car use, traffic congestion, air pollution, and noise. The result is more stress, road trauma, and physical. Uh, oh, road trauma and physical inactivity, as well as worth, worse health overall, and more deaths. Heart health is greatly impacted by several urban env environmental risks. These include air pollution, traffic noise, which contributes to the risk of metabolic disease by raising uh, hormones, hormone levels, heart rate, and blood pressure, and light pollution at night. This is associated with changes in the circadian rhythm, which is linked to conditions including obesity and heart disease. And so... These are ways that we can like help improve our city and that they can help a better heart health in their Thank you. lifestyle. Thank you very much. Thank do you, you guys have time to answer some questions? Yes. <laughs> Council, do you have any questions? Brianna, I'll call on you first. I do not have any questions, but wanted to say thank you for reminding all of us and especially the viewing audience of the importance of living a healthy lifestyle um, and I think even just the symptoms of you know if you're having a heart attack or, or right not being healthy I think those things are important that a lot of times we forget so um, we can get bogged down with a busy lifestyle and forget that it's important to take care of ourselves so thank you thank you so Councilmember Nevels 
Hey, uh, ladies, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I really enjoyed watching your presentation skills. I, I had the, the privilege to w have an occupation where I get to work with young people, and uh, all three of you are excellent presenters, so well done on that. Uh, my question was about, could you give us just a small uh, uh, like tidbit about uh, the HOSA organization and what that is and um, you know, w why are students a part of it? So HOSA is a health science, um, health science organization, and all three of us are taking part in it. So HOSA offers different competitions, and it's mainly to help the community better their lifestyle and helping the community be like their being better so for example we'll go and volunteer in different organizations such as we recently volunteered in the bmw marathon so we helped give uh, runners food and water so we're just trying to help the community like better their lifestyle and so we in hosa there are different competitions as i previously mentioned and so we're taking part of this competition and one of the requirements was to present to a public body so that's what we're here to do today Thank you so much. Just so you know, a former Coppell resident won the half marathon uh, oh. uh, on that. So just yes. note that. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member John. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to echo um, both council members. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm not going to ask you as hard a question as council member <laughs> never did. But uh, ha have you, um, what, what's the reaction from the school students when you guys present something like this to them? Or have you? Uh, we. Wait, can you please repeat the question? What, what's the reaction? Well, I thought it was easier. <laughs> uh, what do you ha have? You guys presented this, this, you know, the present presentation that you just gave us to the other students, and if you did, what was their reactions to that? Um, so no, we didn't. But this is going to be one of our presentations. We'll be presenting in one of our competitions so that we can like further in. The yeah, because I learned something new just by watching the uh, the slides as well. So uh, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Council, anything else? So are you guys going to be able to say now that you've got the, the, the vetting of the Coppell City Council to, in your background now? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much for coming out. I know it's probably a little bit unnerving standing down there, but you guys did a great job, and thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. thank you so much. All right, item number six is a smart city board recommendation presentation. You guys are going to have a hard act to follow there. Uh, we have board chair Ramesh Preman Kumar. Uh, Mayor, that was exactly my thoughts. That's going to be a tough act to follow. Oh, <laughs> ladies, amazing job. You just made life very difficult for me. In my defense, I didn't go through the Coppell High School system, so I don't have that edge. Great job. Hi, uh, my name is Ramesh Prem Kumar. I'm the uh, uh, chair in 2022 for the Smart City Board. Uh, with me, uh, Aaron and Vice Chair um, Karishka. So they're going to help me present. Um, I'm going to try to figure out how to use this clicker. All right. Okay. Uh, so in this slide, you have the entire board. Uh, like I said, three of us are here. I think there might be a couple more uh, in the Zoom link. We also have Jared, who is an amazing staff liaison for us. Thank you, Jared. So uh, as most of you already know, um, Smart City Board is, is your creation. Uh, this, this was designed to prepare Coppell for, for our citizens, uh, trying to make sure that we leverage the technology and all the communication innovations that are happening. Uh, so this is sub supposed to be an advisory board that is looking at what is going to happen in 2040 and beyond and then trying to help the city council make some decisions in the near term. So th this slide is a quick recap of what has been done. Uh, so you all created this board in 2020. In October of 2020, we came back to you with a framework. Um, in November of 2021, we came back to you with recommendations for two portfolios in this framework. And um, so uh, this slide is, is a quick recap of what was presented to you in October 2020. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, my plan is not to go deep into this. If you have any questions about it, I can always come back to you. Um, so for tonight, the agenda is going to be that we are going to cover uh, two of the 
six portfolios. So going back, you will see the Greek Parthenon, and there's those six pillars in the middle. Um, so in 2021, we covered, I believe, uh, number two and five, and then today we are going to be covering three and four. So um, portfolio number three is, is going to be about um, uh, autonomous vehicles and, and, and transportation as a service, and we are also going to be talking about how uh, robotics, automation, artificial intelligence is really going to change the life of COPAL citizens. So the process for the presentation today is uh, we're going to give you an overview of the portfolio. We're going to walk you through the uh, research recap and finally co conclude that with a recommendation for each of the portfolios. Um, so the first recommendation we have for, have for you actually goes across all the portfolios. Uh, so this is the recommendation where we think Copel City is already doing wonderful things to be branded as a smart city. Uh, so we think that uh, the city council should empower the staff uh, to come up with a marketing strategy in 2023 and perhaps request budget from you in 2024 to uh, start marketing Coppel as a, a smart city. And then it could start with as simple as um, updating our website to say that we are already a smart city and, and, and set some goals uh, for what we want to be achieving in the next five, ten years. Um, so the, the first recommendation uh, in portfolio number three, uh, like I said, this has to do with um, the trend of autonomous vehicles, uh, cities uh, implementing transportation as a service. So uh, the uh, vision is we want to make sure that the Coppel citizens have a, a great quality of life. Um, so how we do this through uh, AVs is, is what we are going to talk about in the next few slides. Um, this is a lot of research here. I'm not going to go through all of it. As you can see, um, what jumps out is it looks like a majority of Coppel residents will likely be um, having a fully self-driven car. Um, they might, well, we already have cities exploring the concept of providing transportation as a service. Arlington is already doing that. It's, all, it's, being, it's being done in prototype mode. So it is quite possible that uh, the citizens of Coppel would expect uh, the city to be providing uh, the infrastructure for autonomous vehicles and the transportation as a service. Um, so th th there is a, a lot of um, challenges out there. Um, le let me f move into the risks. So with all the benefits of autonomous vehicles, uh, there is definitely going to be commercial risks, legal risks, as well as technological risks. Uh, we try to capture a lot of that. Uh, you will see that in the appendix. Uh, my plan is not to go into each one of them today. Uh, so I'll move on to our first recommendation in Portfolio 3. Um, through our research, um, we found out that there is an organization called Texas CAV, which stands for Connected and Autonomous Vehicle. So this is an organization that is giving out grants to city that are willing to participate with them on prototypes for um, autonomous vehicles and, and um, uh, AVs. So uh, we can uh, benefit from this. So if we have a um, proposal, if you can empower the staff to come up with a proposal, they can work with Texas CAV and get money from them and actually implement the pro project which will benefit Coppel citizens. So potentially this could be a low cost to the city solution. Um, I'll move on to the next one. So uh, like the saying goes, uh, change happens gradually and then it happens all of a sudden. So if we are uh, expecting uh, sig significant autonomous vehicles usage in 2040, uh, I believe the city has to start preparing for it today. Um, so this could be um, building infrastructure that supports um, battery operated vehicles, uh, putting sensors on the streets for autonomous vehicles to, to function. So um, several uh, small steps needs to happen. And uh, our recommendation is that you uh, empower the staff to, to um, come up with projects that can take handle this one step at a time. All right. Um, so uh, none of these initiatives is going to be a success unless we have the uh, broad support of, the, of our citizens. Uh, so our last recommendation on this portfolio is uh, that we engage residents 
to, to uh, ask them for their ideas on how they want to leverage autonomous vehicles. So some of the ideas could be uh, sending out a survey for the citizens to answer, uh, engaging the high school smart students to, to, uh, to uh, give them a contest on how they think AVs will, will change the life of Coppell. Um, perhaps coming up with AVs for specific events uh, like the July Independence Day fireworks where we have the parking problem. Maybe we can solve that through AVs. Uh, and then finally, uh, maybe we can partner with uh, companies like IBM down the street or, or Very Space or even the Chamber of Commerce to, uh, like we do with the hospitality um, uh, solution, we can partner with uh, sister cities and with uh, local businesses to come up with ideas on how we can in incrementally uh, adopt AVs. So that's all I have for this portfolio. For the next one, I'm going to hand over to Erin. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Um, so I'm going to be talking about robotics and the automated workforce, which is a super cool topic if anybody has done any kind of research into figuring out what there is in this area. Um, by 2040, we expect that robots and automation is going to be very prevalent in city services. It's going to help the efficiency, and citizens are going to start to be to where they actually expect that. So that's kind of where we're looking for in 2040, what are we going to be implementing and how are we actually going to get there? Um, and that's something that, you know, our board has been tasked with doing is helping you guys start now to looking at 2040 and what we're going to be doing at that point. Um, so I'll let y'all read the purpose, but that's basically just the purpose that you guys have set forth for this particular portfolio. Um, so as far as the research goes, um, let me see, I'm going to skip to this slide because it's more fun. Um, so just as far as what there is out there. So first of all, 3D printing. When I think of 3D printing, I think of those little printers that our kids are using to print toys, but they are doing such amazing things with 3D printing right now. Um, so Dubai was the first city to actually print an entire administrative building using 3D printing. And they are printing houses, they are printing residential um, neighborhoods in days. So talk about the Beltline project, that thing would be done um, by now if we're talking about 3D printing. So we really can um, improve these, the services to our citizens with, the, with 3D printing, which is going to be a huge thing of the future. So, uh, so that's just one of the examples. Another example is um, we've, we've done a lot of research on robotic law enforcement. So in Dubai in 2017, they launched their first robotic police officer, um, uh, which they are actually, I mean, that's out. That's something that can be purchased. That's a thing. Um, and so basically what the robotic police officer was doing was more menial tasks like, you know, parking tickets and the, the, taking that time to where our human law enforcement officers can spend their time in other emergent situations and responding to emergencies rather than dealing with things like, um, like traffic tickets and that type of thing. And so in that case also, there, one of the cool things was they could report crimes to this, off this robotic officer and then it can immediately broadcast it to uh, law enforcement officials, uh, the public, that type of thing. Um, so that's something that we've seen and that's in Dubai. And then the, my last example, y'all probably saw this during COVID, there was a robotic dog that they purchased in Honolulu. Um, and they spent $150,000 of federal relief money on this thing. And they released it into the park uh, to go, I think it was taking the, seeing if homeless people had fevers to eliminate that being a risk in their shelters. Um, and we're gonna get to why this is important in a minute, but the public flipped out and was, was thinking, you know, RoboCop. And so it's important, you know, because they had to actually, they took it out of circulation. So they spent $150,000 on this dog and then had to take it out of circulation because the citizens just were not having it. Um, and so that kind of goes into laying the groundwork um, to get to where we need to go. It's obviously going to include one of our assumptions that we called it in these, and we didn't list these in the recommendations, is that there's going to be some kind of education to the citizens. They need to know what's coming. They need to be ready for this so that they don't have a panic attack. Uh, so, as far as the recommendations, the first thing, I don't think that's the first thing, okay. So, I think as a city, our first, I, our first thought is to decide what you guys want to do. What type of implementation of procedures or 
products do you guys want to see in 2040? Because the possibilities are literally endless. Um, I only have, I think, probably three more minutes, so I can't go through all the possibilities, but automation in software, um, it, there's just so many different things. Drones um, is a big thing right now, so as far as drones doing surveying um, or you know co any kind of uh, compliance for city inspections, those types of things, drone could be implemented for that. So the city's going to have to sit down and y'all are going to have to decide what do we want to do? Which things on this potential list do we want to do? Um, and a lot of the research that I had read said to start small, pick, <coughs> pick small projects and then implement those first, see how that goes, because uh, a lot's going to go into doing that. So obviously cost and cost sharing, this is expensive. I was thinking like this 3D thing that's going to print this cement is the expense, but in addition to that, there's the research that goes into actually developing these products is extremely expensive. So a lot of the cities that are engaging in this, uh, these behaviors are partnering with each other to share the cost of that. So they're sharing the cost of research, um, and they're sharing, I assume, the cost of you know production and, and sharing equipment and that type of thing as well. So one of our recommendations is to, with surrounding cities or even businesses, somehow come up with a share uh, cost sharing plan for that. Um, engage in experts. So as everybody knows, technology changes so quickly. Um, and there are all different areas of technology. You can't get one expert that's going to know every single thing about every single product. So one of our recommendations is to engage experts that can help the city staff um, on whatever particular implementation the city decides they want to do. Um, this, as a lawyer, obviously, this is my particularly favorite recommendation. Um, everybody knows that you have to have policy in place. All the lawyers need to sit down and write policy that you guys are going to eventually say, yes, let's do that. And that's a big thing. That was a big thing in the reach research is that you guys are going to have to implement policy to protect privacy, um, to pr protect constitutionality, um, and due process, and all of those other fun legal things that are going to have to go into it. And when we talk about you know fun stuff like robots and that type of thing, I think that kind of gets a little bit forgotten, but it is a very important important part of what you guys are going to have to do. So our recommendation is to consider policy impl implementation that's going to have to happen in order for this to go forward. Um, and that's it. It's all for me. So do you want to open it up to do have questions for us? or? So I'm going to lead off the questioning, and Ramesh, it, it's kind of for you. Okay. You said that you recommended branding uh, Capella Smart City by 2030. My question is, why not now? Oh, I, I, I'm, I Mr. Mayor, maybe I, I misspoke. I was trying to say we should start branding effective 2024, not 2020, not 2030. Oh, 2024. Yes, I apologize oh. if I said okay. 2030. Much better. That that works very well because I was at a meeting this morning and it was on smart cities, and they gave three criteria for a city to consider itself to be a smart city. And one of them was to have a working group, and I consider our, our board to be that, to have a strategy in place, and I consider that what you guys are, have done and are doing the strategy, and have um, citizen and elected member involvement. And so we fit all three of those criteria. So, yes, so 2024 is a good answer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, Council, do you have any questions? So this is going to be, you know, when the Smart Cities Board was created, we knew it was going to be a long, evolving uh, operation, and I think you guys have made some great uh, strides, and, and we look forward to hearing the updates, and thank you very much for all the work you guys do. I know it's a lot of it's kind of behind the scenes, and, um, you know, it's not happening yet, but it's coming, and I think all of your data is showing that, so thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Okay, item number seven is our citizen's appearance. Tonight, we also have two public hearings which are separate from the citizen's appearance, and those will be heard as part of the regular agenda items. For our citizen's appearance, persons wishing to speak on any matter other than an item schedule for the public hearings I was just talking about must sign the register and list their address. Presentations by individuals shall be limited to two minutes each. An individual speaker time may be extended for an additional two minutes with approval of the majority of the council members present. Person signed up to speak will be called in the order that they signed up. 
No personal attacks by any speaker should be made against any member of the council, the mayor, individual group, or corporation. There will be no comments or deliberation from the city council due to the requirements of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Once uh, the timer sounds, the city secretary will cut and break in and make the request to the mayor and city council if we would like to expend the speaker's time for the additional two minutes. We do have four speakers that have signed up to speak tonight. Uh, the first one is Mr. Dave Schaff. Dave? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council. Uh, my name is Dave Schaff. Address is 215 West Wind Drive. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the City Council for approving the winter averaging method of determining sewer water charges for the 2023 budget year. Starting this spring, this will result in significant savings for about 30% of Capel households, especially small ones, including many senior citizens, and a vastly more fair, equitable, and representative means of billing for actual usage. However, that being said, and ahead of budget meetings for next year, I believe there are still areas which should be addressed to still more fairly and equitably allocate water and related billing. The issue is how that cost should be equitably allocated to users with services still funded as needed. As such, I'll present again what I consider to still be points of consideration in that regard, especially to small and elderly households. One, review the tier level rates of water sewer usage further and add more tiers with greatly increased charges for higher level tiers with exceptionally high usage. Two, in conjunction with point number one, reduce the base charge for water services by as much as 20 to 40 percent as households should pay more proportionately for the water actually used instead of high base rates even with no usage. In addition, increase the base allotment for household water to 2,000 gallons per month instead of 1,000, as that is more typical of municipalities. Finally, and the most pressing to me on principle alone, is to eliminate the monthly stormwater charge that has been slowly, almost imperceptibly, increased by a dollar per year and will soon amount to $5 per month. This $60 a year cost is like having an additional water bill every year. The stormwater drain system is a basic part of the city's infrastructure. It is not a utility service. We should not be charged a fee on rainfall. This system should be funded solely through property tax revenue, and use of a fee appears to only be a way to get revenue without using property taxes, which I'm led to believe was ill-conceived advice from outside consultants a few years ago, who apparently had no consideration for the disproportional effect, again, this has on small and elderly households. As such, I see no reason or justification for having a stormwater surcharge. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments this evening. The second speaker signed up is uh, Mr. Marcus Gashi. Please state your name and address for the record. Marcus Gashi, 237 South MacArthur Boulevard. Um, thank you for your time, City Council. Uh, it's an honor, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to talk about the Wagon Tails Dog Park and maintenance that is definitely needed for it. Uh, the first of which is repairs to the dog park fence. There's many openings all along the fence where we've observed do dogs escaping. It's an off-leash park. Um, then they're, they're in danger of hitting traffic right there. There's also uh, been spotted coyotes right outside, so this is maintenance that's very much needed. Um, also requesting... Um, there's currently sewer water that's draining through the park currently. Um, the Parks Department, they put up a temporary gate around it, but it's been there for weeks, and that water's just stagnating, and it poses a risk to public health. Um, the next thing is recently um, the park hours were scaled back, so it used to close at 10 p.m. Now it closes 30 minutes after sunset. Um, sunset today, it was at 5.37 p.m., so that means the park closes at 6.07 p.m., which makes it extraordinarily difficult for someone who works full-time to actually make it there and time to exercise with their dogs. Um, surrounding parks nearby, such as Bacon Dog Park, closes at 9 p.m., McKinnish Dog Park, 10 p.m., Hound Mound, 9 p.m., Railroad Park in Louisville, 11 p.m., Wagon Tails Dog Park, 6.07 p.m. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, the last and final issue is we requested um, lights for the park because it does get dark very quick at 5.30, like I said. Um, we've made multiple requests for these lights over many months. They've all been denied. 
which is understandable. You know, we know the budget isn't completely, uh, you know, can't handle everything, but some citizens of Coppell did take it upon themselves to install park lights on our own. They were solar powered. They looked beautiful. They were professionally installed. Um, I do have some visual aids. I can, I can show you those. Um, after about 11 months, they were chopped down recently. Now we have no lights. So if we can get some sponsored by the city, that'd be great. If not, please give us our lights back and we'd love to install them ourselves. Thank you for your time. And I do have a, um, if y'all would like to, may I show you the picture? So, thank you very much. You can pass those off to Sarah and she will distribute them. Thank you for your comments this evening. Our third speaker this evening is Mr. John Gorman. Uh, certainly. Uh, the fourth speaker then is Cassius Hartle. Hello and good evening. My name is Cassius Hartle, 611 Duncan Drive. Um, I'm also speaking on Wagon Tails Dog Park. Uh, I wanted to bring up six points for the council tonight, um, potentially using an additional minute or two if necessary. Uh, the first one is that the population of dogs is increasing nationwide. It's considerably increased, uh, especially during 2020 as everyone was home from um, from work with COVID or working from home for various other reasons. Um, and sp specifically with that, the more citizens are able to exercise their pets, the fewer pets will be left outside by themselves or um, stuck inside and chewing carpet or shoes or couch cushions, um, which typically leads to pets being put up for adoption or uh, if they're left in the backyard, digging holes and escaping on their own. Uh, third, the health and safety were greatly improved with the lights that were installed at the park. Uh, I realized that these were lights installed by citizens after repeated requests uh, to the city were denied. Um, this allowed me to exercise my two dogs after I get home from work. Uh, I, I work in Dallas and routinely get home after 6 p.m. Uh, due to the traffic that's associated with the DFW area that we all live in and love. Um, but being able to exercise my dogs allowed me to uh, have a good quality of life and also improve the quality of life for my dogs as well as all the other people that uh, exercise their pets there at the same time. Uh, fourth point is that general maintenance is um, regularly neglected, which actually ends up costing the city quite a bit more. Um, if you think about it from a, a pure cost standpoint, it costs maybe $30 or so to turn off the water for the fountains. Um, but if that water is not turned off and the fountain breaks like it did last year, uh, it's going to end up costing the city thousands of dollars potentially to install and or repair um, new faucets or new fountains for the park. Uh, additionally, the the fountains that are installed are typically turned off once throughout the in, in November time frame and then turned on again in March. Uh, but as we've seen this week, uh, we regularly have pretty warm winters in Dallas and um, uh, if, if the city approves, I'd like another minute or two. All right, two more. two more yeah. minutes. Um, but, I mean, today is almost 80 degrees. I don't think there's a, a very high risk of the fountains freezing, which, to my understanding, the only reason they're turned off is to avoid the water from freezing in them and uh, damaging the pipes. Uh, so spending you know a little bit of money to have somebody that is regularly at the park maintaining it anyway um, seems like a, a pretty pretty low cost in my mind. Um, and then the camaraderie of regular attenders at the park is um, a community building event. There is, uh, a, if you haven't been out there recently, there's, there's a group of people that are continually there most nights because a lot of people, that once they've found the, the Coppell Dog Park, they, they choose to go there quite regularly uh, because the, the people there are nice to hang out with. And um, I mean, I, I think I know probably 20 or 25 people just from going to the dog park to have my dogs run around. Um, and my last point is that there's one off-leash dog park in the city, uh, but dozens of other park areas that aren't used nearly as often. Uh, MacArthur ball fields are maintained far more. Uh, if you've been to those ballparks, they're beautiful. Uh, I'm guessing millions of dollars were spent to retrofit those fields with the fencing and the gating that they have, as well as maintain the, the grass. Um, but the Coppell dog park in the, in the same parking lot is maintained far less um, and far more used. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you for your comments tonight. Uh, next is Mr. John Gorman. Thank you very much. 
Um, I recently moved. Name and address, please, sir. Uh, John Gorman. The address is 807 Woodlake Drive. And I've been in the area, Valley Ranch, since 94, a mile away. Then last 10 years, 100 yards away in Louisville. And now in September, I moved to Capel. Um, and drive through all the time. But uh, I want to thank the city because our street does not have any curb cuts. So I called the city and immediately they connected me with the ADA compliance officer. And so they are investigating how to put curb cuts because my son is in a power wheelchair and he can't get off the street. And so I am thankful and grateful for the uh, uh, quick response and the uh, attention to that detail. Um, regarding the dog parks, my boy's got a German Shepherd and, uh, and heart health. Uh, the dogs also need to run. And the dog parks are one of the very few places that they can run off leash. Um, there's a lack of clarity on what times parks, and not just the dog park, but also Andy Brown and all the other parks in the area are open. It used to be 11 when I investigated a few years ago. Um, if I go to Google Maps, some parks say 11, others say 10 o'clock. But looking today, um, if you go directly to the dog park, it says uh, 10 o'clock. Um, but if you go to the park's website, this says all parks close 30 minutes after dusk. So today, that would have been 6.07. When I drove by Andy Brown at 6.20, there were 61 cars there. Um, I hope they're not all violating the city ordinances. And I would like to have you know, clarity on that um, on the websites and, and across. Um, there's been a lot of investments in the parks and to see them grow over the years, the trail systems, the Andy Brown West, it's been fantastic. I'd like the same level of investment for the dog parks so that it can equal Hound Mound and Flower Mound, which is a beautiful place and has so many different activities for the dogs. What we have here in Capel is a rock, which is one big boulder for the dogs. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for your comments this evening. Our fifth speaker is Mr. Jack Henderson. Dr. Jack Henderson, 617 Pheasant Lane. To the mayor, mayor pro tem, board members, and city manager, I attended the Parks and Recreation Board meeting yesterday. During the meeting, I was told by staff I could not speak regarding agenda item number six, although the title included pickleball. I had to defer to next month's meeting to make my comments during the citizen forum. I was told the agenda item was not for discussion. It was not clear the posted agenda item was not for discussion. The presentation regarding pickleball did not reference involvement of senior citizens. I am thankful for the board members who asked questions relevant to the concern of senior pickleball players. Senior pickleball players were able to play pickleball before the COVID lockdown at the core and at the senior community center, but not after the lockdown was lifted. How was the decision made to deny senior pickleball players the right to play inside out of the heat and cold? That was a very robust indoor program at the court prior to COVID. There were four indoor courts used two days a week in the morning. This was a well-managed indoor pickleball program with a volunteer coordinator. Then everything was moved to, magnet, to wagon wheel without any known input from senior pickleball players at the core by the senior and community center. This was a case of fixing what was not broken. Thank you for listening. I, along with others, uh, would like to see Indo Pickleball be placed on the Parks and Recreation Board agenda. Thank you. Thank you for your comments tonight. All right, item number eight is our consent agenda. The consent agenda is routine in nature and is generally enacted in one motion. These items have been previously approved through the budget or past council actions. 
Any item may be pulled and considered separately. Full descriptions are available on the screen. Council, do you have any items that you would like uh, to pull? Seeing none, I'll... Council Member Carroll. I was going to make a motion to approve. Does that work for you? That works for me. Okay. I, I move to approve item number 8A through C. Have a second by Council Member Nevels. All in favor? Long and Hosa Smith, Carol Nevels, John Matthew Hill. All in favor, none opposed. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Item number nine is our is a public hearing, so therefore I open the public hearing. Any person wishing to appear at a public hearing held by the council <coughs> pursuant to the official notice thereof shall sign a register and list his or her address provided by the city secretary outside the council chamber indicating the item on the agenda the person wishes to address. Sir, do we have anybody signed up to speak? Since we have no speakers, I'm going to forego the rest of the reading and turn the item over to Ms. Mary Perone Boswell for reading into the record. Yes, sir. Uh, this is item number nine, public hearing. Consider approval of PD 301R3-HC, Victory at Capel, a zoning change request from PD 301R2-HC, Plan Development 301 Revision 2 to 301R3-HC, Plan Development 301 Revision 3, Highway Commercial, to revise the concept plan for the overall development of the site and allow for a combination of retail, restaurant, offices, medical office, and a daycare on 10 lots totaling approximately 16.77 acres of property, which incorporates a detailed site plan to allow a 12,510 square foot multi-tenant building with restaurant and retail uses on lot 3, Block A, on approximately 1.89 acres, a detailed site plan for a 10,990 square foot multi-tenant building with restaurant and retail uses on lot four, block A, on approximately 1.72 acres, a detailed site plan for a 7,530 square foot building with medical and retail uses on lot nine, block A, on approximately 0.97 acres, and a detailed site plan for a 4,900 square foot multi-tenant building with restaurant and retail uses on lot 10 block A on approximately 1.18 acres located at the southeast quadrant of South Beltline Road and Dividend Drive. That was a mouthful. <laughs> so good evening, Mayor. That was Mayor. why I let you read it. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the property is located on the east side of South Beltline Road between Dividend Drive and Hackberry Road. This PD was originally approved in October of 2022. So why are we here? We're here for two reasons. Uh, one, since October, the developers have lined up some tenants and are needing to make some changes to the concept plan. And number two is for the approval of detailed site plans for lots three, four, nine, and 10. So again, this 16.77-acre uh, uh, tract stretches along the east side of Beltline Road from Dividend to Hackberry. The new concept plan still identifies 10 lots ranging in size with a variety of retail, restaurant, medical, and office buildings fronting on South Beltline Road. All the pad sites along Beltline Road with restaurants uh, are proposing a drive-through component. The reason why we're here before you tonight is really twofold. First, some of the buildings have gotten larger than previously approved, which requires the concept plan coming back before council. So had the lots for, had the buildings for lots two, three, four, and nine matched or been smaller than the previously approved plans, staff could have processed the plans administratively. Secondly, the detailed plans for lots three, four, nine, and 10 are in for approval. The other changes include lot nine, which is uh, the brown one, uh, now having a retail component in addition to the medical space. Lot five um, has decreased in size. So I'm just gonna go over the changes. 
Um, the banquet facility in pad side eight has been eliminated and replaced with office, which requires less parking and in doing so accounts for the repatriation of parking spaces. And lastly, the linear park uh, will be constructed with phase one versus phase two as originally approved. So again, the new concept plan identifies a variety of retail, restaurants, office, medical. Um, the, some of these have expanded in size, necessitating a revision to the concept plan. The proposed changes are a result of actual tenants, specifically restaurants, needing more building space than originally proposed. There are four detailed site plans submitted for phase one, which includes lots three, four, nine, and 10. The restaurants for lots three and four required additional room, expanding the buildings up to 2,000 square feet. The building on lot nine will also have a retail component in addition to the medical portion and almost doubled in size from 4,000 to 7,530 square feet. Uh, and then we have a Starbucks that is proposed to occupy the end cap of lot 10. All of these changes create a domino effect in the overall site, the lot lines, the parking, et cetera. Also proposed for phase one is the construction of the center spine road going north to south from Dividend Drive to Hackberry Road. This will allow for the development of the lots fronting South Beltline Road and the required fire, fire lanes. The other driveway approaches on Beltline will also be part of the first phase of development allowing for cross access and fire lane requirements. So again, part one was the, is the approval of the revised concept plan. Part two is the approval of the detailed site plans for lots three, four, nine, and 10. So this is um, lot three, which is proposed to have an increase in square footage from 10,350 square feet to 12,510 square feet. Proposed to be restaurant and retail, <clears throat> and it will have 96 parking spaces. The landscaping is on the right, the uh, site plan's on the left. Site plan is, and landscaping are compliant. And just quickly, this is the elevation. Really nothing has changed other than the building getting slightly larger. So I'm gonna go through uh, the four detailed site plans fairly quickly, because really nothing has changed other than them getting a little bit bigger. So this is lot four. This is on the other side of the main entrance on Beltline Road. Again, an increase in square footage from 9,550 square feet to 10,990 square feet, retail, restaurant with some patio space, 78 parking spaces, landscaping all compliant, and the elevations which you previously saw and were approved. Uh, lot nine, the elevations, um, sorry, this site and building were expanded as previously mentioned from 4,000 to 7,500 and 30 square feet. So this originally was a, a single use building for medical office, but it, this will actually be um, a multi-tenant building for medical and retail. And so the elevation for this um, has slightly changed just to incorporate the larger uh, building size. And it mirrors the others approved sharing the common design elements and materials. Lot 10, actually nothing has changed in lot 10 um, in terms of building size or elevations, just a technical approval of the detailed site plan. And there's the elevations. So just to give you kind of a um, summary of what we just discussed, the proposed changes. So lots two, three, four, nine, larger buildings and lots. Lot 9 now includes medical in addition uh, with to retail. Lot 5 is decreased in size. Lot 8, the banquet hall has been eliminated, replaced with office, which in turn um, 
is a decrease in parking. And the linear park in phase is now going to be constructed with phase one versus phase two. And this is just a summary of, of what we discussed um, and the different parking. So because this is a zone change request, we did send out notices within 200 feet as required by state law, as well as um, additional courtesy notices within 800 feet, and we had no responses. So the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval of this request subject to the following conditions, uh, less K. <clears throat> there, one, there may be additional comments during detailed engineering review. Two, a final plat will be required prior to the permitting for each detailed plan. Three, the TIA will need to be updated to reflect the proposed building expansion. Um, an update on that, the TIA has been updated and additional improvements were not required with that um, update. Number four, a, re a right turn lane uh, is to be constructed on South Belt Line Road with this project. Uh, number five, uh, they were to revise the plans and calculations, which they did. And then uh, number six is, are the PD conditions, which are all the same as were previously approved, um, except for K. I'll just read through them. All signage shall comply with city regulations. Plans for the linear park shall require staff approval. The focal point artwork shall require, shall require staff approval and shall be in place prior to the issuance of a CO for the buildings at the rear of the property. A POA shall be required prior to the filing of the plat. Detailed site plan shall be required for the development of any of the lots. A tree survey and tree mitigation, if any, shall be required at the time of detailed plan development. Daycare shall be allowed and shall not require circular drive. Parking shall be allowed in the front yard as shown. Restaurants with drive through shall be allowed as shown on the concept plan to allow the monument signs as presented. And K has been eliminated because they removed the banquet hall. Um, that is the end of my presentation. The applicant is here and I'm here happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah. Quick question, the banquet hall, <coughs> removing the banquet hall, what's the reason for converting that to office? So I, I'd have to let them answer that question, but okay. but it does uh, decrease the amount of parking that is required. Okay. That's, I was curious if it was associated with the parking requirements since some of the other buildings got bigger and other things had to change. Correct. Is that right? Okay. Yes, Thanks. sir. Council Member Nevels. Thank you for the presentation, ma'am. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, a question. Did I hear in the presentation you said lot 10 was a Starbucks? It will contain a Starbucks at, at, one of, at the end cap, yes. Okay, okay. on lot 10. Um, so I, I, I saw in here and I, I heard you say uh, there are actual tenants, not spec tenants, mm -hmm. that are requesting that. Do you have an idea of who those tenants are? Um, I will let the applicant um, identify them. Excellent. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Council, any other questions for Ms. Perone? All right. Uh, does the does applicant have any comments he'd like to make? How you doing, Council? Uh, Bobby Mendoza, uh, 2911 Turtle Creek uh, Boulevard here representing the uh, owner application. Um, on the comment about the banquet hall, it's purely about the parking requirements. Um, you know, the banquet hall was something we were planning on trying to achieve in the development. Weren't sure if that was going to happen uh, because of the changes, you know, in the buildings. Uh, we had to reduce some of the uses, and the banquet hall was the first one to be reduced. Um, on the question for the tenants, um, I can identify a few of them. Um, I'm under a, a, a little bit of a confidentiality for some, but. Uh, we are working with the uh, NCAP coffee user for uh, for lot 10. Um, and then I do have a, uh, a Dilla's uh, Cafe and uh, Piata um, on the two NCAP drive throughs uh, that we can identify. We do have additional restaurants uh, from a breakfast and a, an Italian restaurant that uh, we're working with on the NCAPs non drive through, but uh, at this time we can identify the, the names. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Council, any other questions? 
No, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Comments, questions, thoughts? <clears throat> Councilmember Carroll. Thank you, Mayor. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing and approve item nine with conditions. All right, thank you. Have a sec uh, second by Councilmember Hill. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Long and Hosa Smith, Carol Nevels, John Matthew Hill, all in favor, none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, item number 10 is another public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing and ask Ms. Perone Boswell to read that one into the record. Um, item 10, public hearing, consider approval of PD-299-R-C, a zone change request from PD-299-C to PD-299-R-C to revise the plan development to allow for three office retail buildings on approximately 2.7 acres of property located on the northeast corner of North Coppell Road and State Highway 121. So back in 2019, a PD was approved for this site to build a storage facility with retail space. This did not materialize and the property was sold. The current developer plans to construct three office retail buildings on site. Each building is proposed to be two stories and 9,000 square feet. While the lot is approximately 2.7 acres, it has a non-traditional shape angled to the west and further up on the east side where abuts the residential patio homes. The northernmost portion of the site is in the floodplain and not developable. There's one building located on the north, on the corner of North Coppell Road and State Highway 121 and fronts North Coppell Road. The second building is located northeast of the first building with the front facing 121, approximately 83 feet from the common property line with the residential. And the third building is on the north side of the property, faces into the lot, with the side of the building being approximately 30 feet from the common property line. So each building is parked for both retail and office uses with an overall 23,000 square feet for office, 4,000 square feet for retail, and 97 parking spaces required and provided. The parking spaces are located around the middle building. The buildings were situated on the site to provide a buffer from the adjacent uh, residential units. A masonry screening wall that will match the existing residential wall is also proposed to be constructed along the eastern perimeter up to the erosion hazard setback line, short of the, just short of the entire perimeter. Staff supports this since the site will remain in its natural state with the trees to remain as well as the northern area being located in the floodplain and being undevelopable. Access to the site will be provided by a driveway in North Coppell Road and a second driveway on State Highway 121 Frontage Road. Due to the irregular shape of the lot and the fact that this is a corner lot with double frontage, the building and parking is proposed to be located as shown within the <clears throat> front 60 foot setback. And there's a blue line um, that shows that setback. Staff is supportive of this condition as the lot shape and double frontage is a hardship. So this property is heavily treed with over 2,100 caliper inches of protected trees on site. Um, the proposal identifies the majority of trees along the perimeter of the site will remain. While the trees located interior to the site will need to be removed to allow for the buildings and associated parking. The northern portion of the site, which is also heavily treed and located in the floodplain, <coughs> will remain undisturbed. Approximately 52 trees will be planted on site and upgraded to a four inch caliper. A large number of trees will be planted along the perimeter, specifically along the common property line with the residential. These trees along with the proposed screening wall and placement of the buildings will help with the privacy for the residents. The tree mitigation fees are estimated to be approximately $264,700, even applying the allowed preservation credit and upsizing 
the overstory trees on this site. So these are just some of the uh, elevations. So there's three buildings. They're identified as 1A, 1B, and 2. Um, I just kind of grouped them together. So this is the front side of the building. The architect strategically work strategically to provide buildings that would be attractive and still provide privacy to the residential neighbors. The three buildings will be very similar with slight changes depending on the location on site, the idea being to provide additional privacy for the neighbors. Uh, the buildings will contain two different brick colors, large windows in the front of the building with a metal canopy. A brick cornice will line the top of the building, which will be 35 feet in height at the top of the building, which includes a parapet. And so this is the back side of the buildings, again, for 1, 1A, 1B, and 2. Uh, the right side and the left side. Uh, so what we're looking at right now is a rendering of the site. This is basically a bird's eye view from uh, 121. So build, building 2 <clears throat> is located on the right basically at the corner of Coppell Road and 121. 1B is in the middle, and while 1A is um, on the north part of the site. Again, a different perspective from the corner of 121 and Coppell Road. Uh, and this is from Coppell Road looking towards 121. Again, the, the homes along Da Vinci Court are not shown, so just so you can see the site. Um, also remember that uh, there will be a masonry wall uh, added here. There's one monument sign proposed. Um, no plans were submitted for wall signage, therefore they'd have to comply with uh, city sign regulations. The one monument sign would be six feet in height, ten feet in width, with aluminum channel letters backlit. Um, proposed to be at the corner of Coppell Road and 121. Now we did send out letters um, to property owners within 200 feet, as well as 17 additional courtesy notices within 800 feet. We did have three responses in opposition, and they're identified on the map um, in yellow. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of this request subject to the following conditions. One, there may be additional comments during the detailed engineering review. Two, a final plat is required. Three, a tree removal permit and tree mitigation fees will be required prior to construction. Four, to update the quantity of the plants on the landscape plans, which they have done. Uh, five, to update the plans to list the PD conditions, which they did do, and the conditions are a, to allow the buildings and parking to be located as shown on the site plan. B, to allow the masonry screening wall to end as shown. And C, that building signage must conform with sign ordinance regulations. Um, that is the end of my presentation. I'm not sure if the applicant is, oh, he made it, okay. Sorry, I knew he was flying in late. Uh, so the applicant is here, the representative is here as well to answer any questions. So, um, Councilmember Nevels has a question for you. Again, thank you for this presentation yep. tonight. Um, uh, the three um, uh, letters of opposition. Uh, yes, sir. Could you ref uh, give me a little bit of background on what the reasoning was uh, for sure. opposing, please? So, um, we did receive three letters. One just said in opposition no, with no um, information. The other one was... Um, traffic backing up during rush hour and um, street lights in this area. So we did have engineering look at the street lights and uh, traffic counts, and they are analyzing the need for additional um, lights, or I think around the corner of the bend of that area. Um, the other one was basically that this may cause nuisance to the residents as it's close to the uh, residential community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, 
Council, any other questions for Ms. Prom Boswell? Does the applicant have any comments to make? Does the council have any questions for the applicant? <coughs> council member John for, for Mary. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a quick quest question. Mary, on this, yes. I guess the, um, the site plan, the sidewalk, is that a connecting sidewalk that just ends at the edge of, I guess, 121? Is that public sidewalk? Are you looking at this exhibit? I'm, I'm looking at the site plan. Okay. I guess it's number 21. Just trying to verify that the, is this the five inch curve inlet? But then I think that's not it, but it looks like it, it's an extension of a sidewalk, but then it does end at the end of 121. Or, I is it, or am I just? I believe it. That's what I'm thinking. I believe it does end there, but I'd have to check. Yeah. Sidewalk. Okay. It just, it just ends. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> Any other questions, Council? Um, according to this plan, it does show it ending at uh, 121. Um, when they go through engineering review, if if there is a continuation required, they will do that during that time. Thank you. I was just trying to verify because it looks like it just all of a sudden ends right there, but there's no connection from the end of the sidewalk at right. 121. Yeah, and I think when, when they go through the detail engineering reviewing, then they'll figure all of that out. Yeah, thank you. Councilmember Carroll. Thank you, Mayor. Quick question for the applicant. Um, are, are the buildings, are they all sort of spec in nature or are there potential tenants already being identified or what sort of, what's the game plan on uh, yeah, hi, my name is Greg Guerin. I'm an architect with East Star Design, 2000 Russian Creek Drive, Heartland, Texas. And uh, yes, we have lobbies, elevators, and restrooms, but they're uh, vacant uh, okay. spaces for future identified tenants. Okay, thanks. Council, any other questions? Council Member Nevels. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move to close the public hearing and approve agenda item in, uh, I'm sorry, 10 with conditions. Thank you. Council Member Carroll, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Long and Hosa Smith, Carol Nevels, John Matthew Hill, all in favor, none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate all right. Item number 11 is the city manager report. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this evening, just uh, several points. Beltline, which was referred to earlier this evening, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, 3D print that paper. Yeah, where well, you can print, uh, print the road. Um, I don't know that I've seen that yet. Uh, they will begin pouring the northbound lanes this week. Uh, the intersection project uh, will do a walkthrough next week. Uh, the Moore Road panel replacement, if you've driven down Moore Road, is about 60% complete. Uh, the service center, the contract y'all have recently approved, they had the kickoff meeting uh, this week. Uh, Royal Lane design is 60% complete. And the Ma Magnolia Park Trail design is nearly 100% complete. And we are just waiting on permits from the Army Corps of Engineers. And lastly, uh, since Wagon Tail was mentioned this evening, on uh, February 14th, the council will be briefed on the results of the survey and some of the, uh, the plans that are in store for Wagon Wheel and its improvements. Uh, so that concludes my report, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Item number 12 is Mayor and Council reports. Um, just as a reminder, city facilities will be closed for Martin Luther King Day on Monday, January 16th. Families are invited to visit the Cosby Library to celebrate the Lunar New Year Family Fun Night on Tuesday, January 17th from 6.30 to 7.30.
And this is a good time at the beginning of the year with safety in mind to join a CPR AED class offered at the Life Safety Park. Please check their website to register for classes. And for the upcoming May 6, 2023 election, uh, election filing period will begin on Wednesday, January 18th and will end on Friday, February 17th, 2023. Visit the city's election webpage for more information. Item number 13 are public service announcements concerning items of community interest with no council action or deliberation uh, permitted. Does anybody have a public service announcement? I actually do have one. I received a letter uh, from the mayor of Grapevine and it said on behalf of the residents of Grapevine, the city council and city staff, we would like to thank you for your assistance that your city provided immediately following the December 13th tornado attack that destroyed several businesses and damaged many homes in Grapevine. The response by your employees was a true demonstration of the partnership we share in the Metroplex. Residences and business owners in our community appreciated the quick and comprehensive response that day of which your employees were kept a key part. I wish to thank you and know that when you need us, we will be there for you and your communities as you have been for us. Signed, William D. Tate, Mayor of the City of Grapevine. So. I thought that was very nice. I'm going to pass this along to the city manager so that he can share with our public service employees. Um, seeing uh, no other public service announcements, item number 14, we did not have an executive session tonight. So with that being said, there being no further business before this council, we are adjourned at 853.